Section 1 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Preface Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell On occasion of the 200th birthday of President Abraham Lincoln The Lincoln Storybook A judicious collection of the best stories and anecdotes of the great president, many appearing here for the first time in book form. Compiled by Henry L. Williams Preface the Abraham Lincoln statue at Chicago is accepted as the typical Westerner of the Forum, the Rostrum and the Tribune, as he stood to be inaugurated under the war cloud in 1861. But there is another Lincoln, as dear to the common people, the Lincoln of happy quotations, the speaker of household words. Instead of the erect, impressive, penetrative platform orator, we see a long, gaunt figure, divided between two chairs for comfort, the head bent forward, smiling broadly, the lips curved in laughter, the deep eyes irradiating their caves of wisdom, the storytelling Lincoln enjoying the enjoyment he gave to others. This talkativeness, as Lincoln himself realized, was a very valuable asset. Leaving home, he found in a venture at Yankee notion peddling that glibness meant 300% in disposing of flimsy wares. In the camp of the lumberjacks and of the Indian rangers, he was regarded as the pride of the mess and the inspirator of the tent. From these stages he rose to be a graduate of the College of the Yarn Spinner, the village store where he became clerk. The store we know is the township vortex where all assemble to swap stories and deal out the news. Lincoln from behind the counter, his pulpit, not merely repeated items of information which he had heard, but also recited doggerel satire of his own concoction, punning and emitting sparks of wit. Lincoln was hailed as the capper of any good things on the rounds. Even then his friends saw the germs of the statesman in the lank, homely, crack-voiced hobbly hoy. Their praise emboldened him to stand forward as the spokesman at schoolhouse meetings, lectures, log rollings, huskings auctions, fairs, and so on, the folk meets of our people. When watching him in 1830, said foresightedly, Lincoln has touched land at last. In commencing electioneering, he cultivated the farming population and their ways and diction. He learned by their parlance and Bible phrases to construct short sentences of small words. But he had all along the idea that the plain people are more easily influenced by a broad and humorous illustration than in any other way. It is the Anglo-Saxon trait distinguishing all great preachers, actors, and authors of that breed. He acknowledged his personal defects with a frankness unique and startling, told a girl whom he was courting that he did not believe any woman could fancy him, publicly said that he could not be in looks what was rated a gentleman, carried a knife of the homeliest man, disparaged himself like a Brutus or a Pope Sixtus. But the mass relished this plain, blunt man who spoke right on. He talked himself into being the local eminence, but did not succeed in winning the election when first presented as the humble candidate for the state senate. He stood upon his imperfect education, his not belonging to the first families but the seconds, and his shunning society as debarring him from the study he required. Repulsed at the polls, he turned to the law as another channel, supplementing forensic failings by his artful storytelling. Judges would suspend business till that Lincoln fellow got through with his yarn spinning, or underhandedly would direct the usher to get the rich bit Lincoln told and repeat it at the recess. Mrs. Lincoln, the first to weigh this man justly, said proudly that Lincoln was the great favorite everywhere. Meanwhile his fellow citizens, stupidly tired of this merry Andrew, they sent him elsewhere to talk other folks to death. To the state house, where he served several terms creditably, but was mainly the fund of jollity to the lobby and the chartered gesture of the lawmakers. Such loquacious witchery fitted him for the Congress. Elected to the House, he was immediately greeted by connoisseurs of the best stamp, President Martin Van Buren, Prince of the Good Fellows, Webster, another intellect, Saturnine in repose and mercurial in activity, the convivial Senator Douglas, and the like. These formed the wrapped ring around Lincoln in his own chair in the snug corner of the Congressional chat-room. Here he perceived that his rusticity and shallow skimmings placed him under the trained politicians. It was here, too, that his stereotype prologue to his digressions, that reminds me, became popular and even reached England, where a publisher so entitled a joke-book. 
Lincoln displaced Sam Slick and opened the way to Artemus Ward and Mark Twain. The longing for elevation was fanned by the association with the notables, Buchanan to be his predecessor as president, Andrew Johnson to be his vice and successor, Jefferson Davis and Alex H. Stevens, president and vice president of the CSA, Adams, Winthrop, Sumner, and the galaxy over whom his solitary star was to shine dazzlingly. A sound authority who knew him of old pronounced him as good at telling an anecdote as in the thirties. But the fluent chatterer reined in and became a good listener. He imbibed all the political ruses and returned home with his quiver full of new and victorious arrows for the presidential campaign, for his bosom friends urged him to try to gratify that ambition, preposterous when he first felt it attack him. He had grown out of the sensitiveness that once made him beg the critics not to put him out by laughing at his appearance. He formed a boundless arsenal of images and smiles. He learned the American humorist's art not to parade the joke with a discounting smile. He worked out Euclid to brace his fantasies as the steel bar in a cement fence post makes it irresistibly firm, but he allowed his vehement fervor to carry him into such flights as left the reporters unable to accompany his sentences throughout. He was recognized as the destined national mouthpiece. He was not of the universities, but of the universe, the Mississippi of eloquence, uncultivated, stupendous, enriched by sweeping into the innumerable side by use and creeks. Elected and re-elected president, he continued to be a surprise to those who shrank from levity. Lincoln was their puzzle, for he had a sweet sauce for every roast and showed the smile of invigoration to every croaking prophet. His state papers suited the war tragedies, but still he delighted the people with those tales tagging all the events of what may be called the Lincoln era. The camp and the press echoed them, though the cabinet frowned. Secretaries said that they exposed the illustrious speaker to charges of clownishness and buffoonery. But his perennial good humor, perfectly poised by the people, alleviated the strain of withstanding that terrible avalanche threatening to dismember and obliterate the states, and bury all the virtues and principles of our forefathers. Even his official letters were in the same vein. Regarding the one to England which meant war, he asked the secretary Seward if its language would be comprehended by our minister at the Victorian court, and added dryly, Will James, the coachman at the door, will he understand it? Receiving the answer, he nodded grimly and said, Then it goes. It went, and there was no war with the bull. Time has refuted the purblind purists, the chilly wet blankets, and the Lincoln stories, bright, penetrative, piquant, and pertinent, are our classics. Hand in hand with Father Abraham, the president next to Washington in greatness, walks old Abe the storyteller. End of section 1 This recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln Calendar Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell Lincoln Calendar Abraham Lincoln, born February 12, 1809, Hardin County, Kentucky, Lincoln Day. 1817 Settled in Perry County, Indiana, father, mother, sister, and self. 1818, October 5th. Mrs. Thomas Lincoln, Nancy Hanks, died. Buried Spencer County, Indiana. In 1901, a monument erected to her memory, the base being the former Abraham Lincoln Vault. Schooling, a few months, 1819, 20, and 28, about six months school. 1819. Thomas, Father of Abraham Lincoln marries again, Mrs. Johnson, Sally Bush, of Kentucky. 1830, March, Lincoln family removed to Illinois, near Decatur. 1831, works for himself, boat building and sailing, carpentering, hog sticking, sawmilling, blacksmithing, river pilot, logger, etc., in Menard County, Indiana. 1831, election clerk in New Salem, Captain and private re-enlisted in Black Hawk War. Store clerk and merchant, New Salem. Studies for the law. 
1832, first political speech, Henry Clay, Whig platform. Defeated through strong local vote. Deputy surveyor at three dollars a day, Sangamon County. 1834, elected to state legislature as Whig. Resides in Springfield till 1861. Law partner with John L. Stewart till 1840. 1835, postmaster in New Salem, appointed by President Jackson. 1838 to 1840, re-elected to state legislature. 1840, partner in law with S. T. Logan. 1842, married Miss Mary Todd of Kentucky. Of the four sons, Edward died in infancy. William Willie at twelve at Washington. Thomas Tad at Springfield, age twenty. Robert M. T., Minister to Great Britain, Presidential Candidate, Secretary of War to President Garfield. His only grandson, Abram, died in London, March 1890. 1844, proposed for Congress. 1845, law partner with W. H. Herndon for life. 1846, elected to Congress, the single Whig Illinois member, voted anti-slavery, sought abolition in the D.C., Voted Wilmot Proviso. Declined re-election. 1848. Electioneer for General Taylor. 1849. Defeated by Shields for United States Senator. 1852. Electioneered for General Scott. 1854. Won the state over to the Republicans, but by arrangement transferred his claim to the senatorship to Trumbull. October. Debated with Douglas. Declined the governorship in favor of Bissell. 1856. Organized the Republican Party and became its chief. Nominated vice president, but was not chosen by its first convention. Worked for the Fremont Dayton presidential ticket. 1858. Lost in the legislature the senatorship to Douglas. 1859. Placed for the presidential candidacy. Made Eastern tour to get acquainted. 1860, May 9th, nominated for president, shutting out Seward, Chase, Cameron, Dayton, Wade, Bates, and McLean. 1861, March 4th, inaugurated 16th president, succeeds Buchanan and precedes his vice, Andrew Johnson, whom General Grant succeeded. Civil war began by firing on Fort Sumter, April 12th. 1862, September 22nd, emancipation announced. 1863, January 1st, Emancipation Proclaimed, November 19th, Gettysburg Cemetery Address, December 9th, Pardon to Rebels Proclaimed. 1864, Unanimous Nomination as Republican Presidential Candidate for Re-Election, June 7th, Re-Elected, November 8th. 1865, March 4th, Inaugurated for the Second Term. April 14th, assassinated in Ford's Theater, Washington, by a mad actor, Wilkes Booth. April 19th, body lay in state at Washington. April 26th, Booth slain in resisting arrest by Sergeant Boston Corbett, near Port Royal. April 21st to May 4th, funeral train through principal cities north to Springfield, Illinois. 1871, temporarily deposited in Catacomb. 1874, in Catacomb, in Sarcophagus, the completed monument dedicated. 1876, to frustrate repetition of body snatcher's attempt, reinterred deeper. 1900, a fifth removal, the whole structure solidly rebuilt, containing the martyred president, his wife, and their three children, as well as the grandson bearing Abraham's name. End of section 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Childish Rhyme Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman In a copybook, at the age of nine or ten, Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen, He will be good, but God knows when. The small g led a public speaker to denounce the sort of men sordid and ignorant, who write God with a small g and gold with a big one. This was a scrapbook in humble imitation of the albums in the East. 
another copybook motto, a year or so later. Good boys who to their books apply will all be great men by and by. End of section 3 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section number 004 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Little Hatchet Did It. Read for LibriVox.org by Bill Elliott at Vocability.com. In 1823, Abraham Lincoln went briefly to Crawford's school, a log house, pleasing the teacher by his attention to the simple course. The boy had read but a small library, principally Weems's Life of Washington, which had impressed him deeply. This is shown by the following anecdote told by Andrew Crawford, the Spencer County pedagogue. The latter saw that a buck's head, nailed on the schoolhouse, was broken in one horn, and asked the scholars who among them broke it. I did, answered young Lincoln promptly. I did not mean to do it, but I hung on it. He was very tall and reached it too easily, and it broke. Though lean, he weighed fairly. I wouldn't have done it if I had. I thought it would break. Other boys of the class would have tried to conceal what they did and not own up until obliged to do so. His immediate friends believed that the hatchet and tree incident in Washington's life traced this truthful course. End of section number 004. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Little Hatchet Again Turns Up Read for LibriVox.org by Esther The Little Hatchet Again Turns Up In his teens, Abraham Lincoln, while not considered a man, was able to swing an axe with full power. It was the borderer's multifarious tool, and accompanied him everywhere. One time, while sauntering along Gentryville, his stepsister playfully ran at him of a sudden and leaped from behind upon him. Holding onto his shoulders, she dug her knees into his back, a rough trick called fun by these semi-savages, and brought him to the ground. Unfortunately, she caused him to release the axe in his surprise, and it cut her ankle. The boy stopped the wound and bandaged it, while she moaned. Through her cries, he reproached her and concluded, "'How could you disobey mother so?' for she had been enjoined not to follow her brother. "'What are you going to tell her about getting hurt?' "'Tell her I did it with the axe,' she replied. "'That will be the truth?' she questioned, with the prevarication of her sex inborn. "'Yes, that's the truth, but it is not all the truth. You tell the whole truth.' The mother was forgiving, and nothing more came of the casualty. End of chapter 5 This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's Wedding Song Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Lincoln's Wedding Song Abraham Lincoln's own sister Sarah married one Aaron Grigsby, a man in the settler's line of life. And Abraham, a youth under age, composed an apothalamium on the occasion. The title was Adam and Eve's Wedding Song and the principal verses are given to show what roughness pervaded the home on the frontier. The woman was not taken from Adam's feet, we see, so we must not abuse her, the meaning seems to be. The woman was not taken from Adam's head, we know, to show she must not rule him, tis evidently so. The woman, she was taken from under Adam's arm, so she must be protected from injuries and harm. End of section 6. This recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Risk the Hogs and I Will Risk Myself Read for LibriVox.org by Esther At the age of seventeen, Lincoln, the strongest and longest yonker of the neighborhood, was led out by his father for six dollars a month and board to a James Taylor, ferryman of Anderson's Creek and the Ohio River. He was also expected to do the farm work and other jobs, as well as the chores in and about the house. This included tending to the baby, 
the good wives uniting to pronounce Abe the best of helps, as so handy, as Mrs. Toodles would say. He had attained his fixed height, exactly six feet three inches. This is his own record. He really did, with his unusual strength, more than any man's stint, and failing to gain full man's wages, whether it was his father or he handled it, he felt the injustice, which soured him on that point. He enraged his employer's son by sitting up late to read, so that the young man struck him to silence. But the young giant refused from retaliating in kind, whether from natural magnanimity belonging to giants, or from respect for the young master, or from self-acknowledgment that he was in the wrong. He learned the craft of river boatmen in this engagement. One day, on being asked to kill a hog, he replied like the Irishman with the violin, that he had never done it, but he would try. If you will risk the hog, he said, I will risk myself. Becoming a hog slaughterer added this branch of occupation to the many of the men of all work. Taylor sublet him out in this capacity for thirty cents a day, saying, A will do any one thing about as well as another. End of section seven. This recording is in the public domain. Section 8 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The rest was vile. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. The rest was vile. The Lincoln homestead in Indiana in 1820 to 23 had at the first the primitive corn mill in the Indian fashion, a burnt-out block with a pounder rig to a well sweep, a water mill being set up ten miles off on Anderson's Creek that was superseded as improvement march by a horsepower one. To this Lincoln, as a lad of sixteen or seventeen, would carry the corn in a bag upon an old flea-bitten grey mare. One day, on unhitching the animal and loading it, and running his arm through the headgear loop to lead, he had no sooner struck it and cried, Get up, you de- when the beast whirled around and lashing out, kicked him in the forehead so that he fell to the ground insensible. The miller, Hoffman, ran out and carried the youth indoors, sending for his father, as he feared the victim would not revive. He did not do so until hours after having been carried home. When conscious, his faculties, as psychologically ordained, resumed operations from the instant of suspension, and he uttered the sequel to his outcry. Phil, Lincoln's own explanation is thus. Just before I struck the mare, my will through the mind had set the muscles of my tongue to utter the expression, and when her heels came in contact with my head, the whole thing stopped half-cocked, as it were and was only fired off when mental energy or force returned. His friends interpreted the occurrence as a proof of his always finishing what he commenced. End of section 8. This recording is in the public domain. Section 9 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams No heaping coals of fire on that head. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther no heaping coals of fire on that head the wantonly cruel experiment of testing the sensitiveness in reptiles armoured passed into a proverb out west in pioneer times besides carving initials and dates on the shells of land tortoises boys would fling the creatures against tree or rock to see if it perished with its exposed and lacerated body or literally placed burning coals on the back in such cases lincoln a boy in his teens but a redoubtable young giant would not only interfere vocally but with his arms if needed don't terrapins have feelings he inquired the torturer did not know the right answer and persisting in the treatment had the shingle wrenched from his hand and the cinders stamped out while the sufferer was allowed to go away well feelings are none he won't be burned any more while i am around he did not always have to resort to force in his corrections as he obtained the title of peacemaker by other means, and the spell in his tongue at that age. End of section 9. This recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Stumping the Stump Speaker Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman when Lincoln became a man, and, divorced from his father's grasping tyranny, 
set up as a field hand. He lightened the labor in Menard County by orating to his mates, and they gladly suspended their tasks to listen to him recite what he had read and invented, or rather, adapted to their circumscribed understanding. Besides mimicry of the itinerant preachers, he imitated the electioneering advocates of all parties and local politics. One day, one such educator collected the farmers and their help around them to eulogize some looming-up candidate, when a cousin and admirer of young Lincoln cast a damper on him, crying out, with general approval, that Abe could talk him dry. Accepting the challenge, the professional spellbinder allowed his place on the stump of the cottonwood to be held by the raw Demosthenes. To his astonishment, the country lad did display much fluency, intelligence, and talent for the craft. Frankly, the stranger complimented him and wished him well in a career, which he recommended him to adopt. From this cheering, Lincoln proceeded to speak in public, his limited public, talking on all subjects till the questions were worn slick, greasy, and threadbare. End of section 10. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 11 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Making the Wool, Not Feathers, Fly Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman The export trade of the Indiana farmers was with New Orleans, the goods being carried on flatboats. The traffic called for a larger number of resolute, hardy, and honest men, as, besides the vicissitudes of fickle navigation, was the peril from thieves. Abraham Early made acquaintance with this course as he accompanied his father in such a venture down the great river. Then past apprenticeship, he built a boat for Gentry, merchant of Gentryville, and sailed it with the storekeeper's son, Allen, as bowhand or first officer. He and his crew of one started from the Ohio River landing and safely reached the Crescent City, safely as to cargo and bodies, but not without a narrow escape. At Baton Rouge, a little ahead of the haven, the boat was tied up at a plantation, and the two were asleep when they became objects of an attack from a river pest, a band of refugee negroes and similar lawless rogues. Luckily their approach was heard and the two awoke, Having been warned that the desperadoes would not stand on trifles, the young men armed themselves with clubs and leaped ashore after driving the pirates off the deck. They pursued them, too, with such an uproar that their number was multiplied in the runaway's mind. Both returned wounded, Abraham retaining a mark over the right eye, noticeable in after life, and not to his facial improvement. They immediately unhitched the boat and stood out in the channel. "'I wish we had carried weapons,' sighed Lincoln. "'Going to war without shooting irons is not what the Quakers hold it to be.' "'If we had been armed,' returned Allen, as regretfully, "'we would have made the feathers fly.' It had not been too dark for the shade of the enemy to be perceived, so his skipper gave one of his earnest laughs and replied, you mean wool, I reckon. End of section 11. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 12 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Log Rolling to Save Lives. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther. Log Rolling to Save Lives It was in the spring, after the deep snow of 1831, that three or four lumbermen, who had built a large flat boat for carrying a cargo to New Orleans, were on the Sagamon River, trying the rowboat, or scow, to accompany the vessel. The river was very high and on the run. Two of the men leaped into the boat, to get the drink for being the first in, and sent her out into the current. They were unable to stem it and roll back. Lincoln shouted for them to head up and try the sleeping or dead water along the shore. 
but they were mastered and paddled for a wrecked boat, which had a pole sticking up. But though the man who grabbed for it secured his hold, the boat was capsized and the other was flung into the tide. Lincoln, as captain, shouted out to him, Carmen, swim for that elm tree down there. You can catch it. Keep calm. Lay hold of a branch. The tree was at a convenient height, and Carmen caught on and swung himself out. But the icy water chilled him to the bone. But he was safe for the present. Seeing which, the captain called out to the other to let go his pole and let himself be carried down to the tree also. If he hung on in the open there much longer, he would become stiff and unable to swim. The man managed to reach his mate, and the two were joined at the tree. The manager of the rescue found a log, and, attaching a rope, rolled it into the stream, with the help of others who had arrived on the scene. They towed it up some distance to get a good send-off, and a young daredevil got on to it with the intention of being floated down to the tree, where all three would become passengers and be drawn home. But in his haste to do so, Jim Dorrell raised himself off the log by the branch he grasped, and, along with the other unfortunates, made three men to be saved. When the riderless log was hauled up in shore, Lincoln mounted it to make the next cast in person. Having an extra rope with him, he lassoed the tree and soon drew the log up. Cold as they were, the three men dropped down and straddled beside him. At his orders, the men on the bank held the rope taut, so that the log, allowed to swing off freely, slung around with the current to the side, and the four were disembarked. This made Abraham the hero of the Sagamon River among the boatmen. Narrated by John Rolls of New Salem, a witness. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's First Dollar Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell As in all farming communities, where the only movement of currency is when the crop comes in and the debts accumulating during the growth are settled, and the slight surplus spent, the Indiana pioneers little new extra cash. To obtain it, the men used their off hours in guiding intending settlers, assisting surveyors and prospectors, felling and hewing trees, and horse trading. Another source of income out of bounds was to send a stock of produce down the river to sell or barter for the southern plantation produce. As there was talk at home of furnishing their house, Abraham bethought him of this resource. His father consented readily to any notion that might result in gain, and his mother, though believing nearly two thousand miles of water travel onerous, allowed her yes. Besides, the young men, by excessive work on their place, had piled up a goodly stock of sellable stuff. Abram had only to make a boat. It was small, merely to hold the venture and his hand bundle of plunder for the trip and land cruise at New Orleans. Western country boys, who had seen the Crescent City, talked of the exploit as the Easterners of seeing Europe. Abe was maneuvering his boat on the Ohio River at Rockport when he heard the whistle announcing the approach of a steamboat. These craft were not enabled to make a landing anywhere, even with a run-out gangplank, but took passengers and parcels aboard by lighters. Lincoln's small boats seemed admirably placed to serve as a transport to a couple of gentlemen who came down to the shore to ship on the steamboat. The trunks were taken out of their carriages, and they selected Lincoln's new boat among some others. In his homespun, the gawky youth looked what he was, not the owner of the craft and about to try a speculation on the river, but one of the scrubs. The scrubs, not from any relation with washing, quite otherwise, were those poor families on the outskirts of towns who lived in the scrub or dwarf pines. Accordingly, one of them asked, indicating the flatboat, Who owns this? The hero relates the story thus. I answered somewhat modestly, I do. Will you take us and our trunks out to the steamboat? Certainly, glad of the chance of earning something. I suppose that each of them would give two or three bits, practically the dime of nowadays. Lincoln carried the passengers aboard the vessel and handed up their trunks. 
each of the gentlemen drew out a piece of silver and threw it on the little deck. Gentlemen, you may think it was a very little thing, and in these days it seems to me a trifle. But it was a most important incident in my life. I could scarcely believe my eyes as I picked up the two silver half-dollars. I could scarcely credit that I, a poor boy, had earned a dollar in less than a day, that by honest work I had earned a dollar. Lincoln's flatboatman wage was ten dollars a month. Related by Frank B. Carpenter, the portrait painter, as given out by President Lincoln to a party of friends in the White House Executive Chamber, Secretary Seward notably being among them. End of section 13 This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Conviction Through a Thrashing Read for LibriVox.org by Alex Sierra Conviction Through a Thrashing In 1831, Abraham Lincoln, returning from a voyage to New Orleans, paid the usual filial visit to his father, living in Coles County. A famous wrestler, one Needham, hearing of the newcomer's prowess in wrestling, more general than pugilism on the border, called to try their strength. As the professional was in practice, and as the other, from his amiable disposition and his forbidding appearance, was not so, the latter declined the honor of a hug and the forced repose of lying on the back. Nevertheless, taunted into the trial, he met the champion and defeated him in two goes. The beaten one was chagrined and vented his vexation in this defiance. Ye have thrown me twice, Lincoln, but you cannot whip me. I do not want to, and I don't want to get whipped myself, was the simple reply. Well, I stump you to lick me, went on Needham, thinking he was gaining ground. Throwing a man is one thing, and licking him another. Look here, Needham said the badgered man at last. If you are not satisfied that I can throw you every time and want to be convinced through a thrashing, I will do that too, for your sake. The man backed out, but he was ever after one of the champion's warmest friends. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Boating on the Ground, A Little Damp Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg Boating on the Ground, A Little Damp In a letter of August 1862, the President alludes to the amphibious minor navy, which made their tracks wherever the ground was a little damp. This is hardly an exaggeration of western shallow water navigation. Lincoln, as pilot on the Sangamon River in 1831, was engaged to run a steamboat called the Talisman, after Sir Walter Scott's popular romance. It was to test the point whether the Sangamon River was navigable or not, an important local problem on which Lincoln later got into the legislature. As he had tried the river a good deal with the flatboats, he answered he would try and do the best he could. A large crowd flocked in from all sides to witness this experiment. Lincoln guided the bark well up to the new Salem Dam. Here a gap had been cut to let the vessel slip through. But at a place called Bogue's Mill, the water was rapidly lowering and they had to wheel about and get back or be shoaled and be held there until the spring freshets. The return trip was slow, as though the stream was in his favour, the high prairie wind delayed the boat. The falling water had made the broken hole in the dam impracticable. But Lincoln backed the talisman off as soon as she stranded and stuck, and by casting an anchor so as to act as a giant grapnel to tear away some more of the dam. The opening sufficed for the boat to coast on the stones and get over into deep water. I think, says an old boatsman, J. R. Rowe Herndon, that the captain gave Lincoln forty dollars to keep on to Beardstown. I'm sure I got that. End of section 15. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 16 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Initiator Installed. Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman. As a fruit of incessant study, Abraham Lincoln fitted himself to accept the post of a clerk at Ophid's store in New Salem in 1831. It was a responsible position, requiring strict honesty, intelligence, glib talk, attention, and courtesy to the few dames in the population of twenty households, with the back settlement to hear from. In fact, Lincoln's gifts and cultivated acquirements made him such a favorite that the list of customers from out of town was extensive. This promotion of a newcomer nettled the bad element of the region. They were located from congeniality in a suburb termed Clary's Grove. Like the tail which undertakes to wag the dog, this tag constituted itself the criterion and proposed initiating any accession to the inhabitants. To take the conceit out of the upstart who had leaped from the flatboat deck to behind the counter at the store, the acme of a bumpkin's ambition, they selected their bully. This Jack Armstrong was held so high by Bill Clary, father of the Grove Boys, that he bet with Ophut, over loud in his praise of his help, that Jack could beat Abe, and your Abe has got to be initiated anyway. Abraham refused under provocation to have anything to do with rough-and-tumble fighting, as known as scuffle-and-tussle and wooling-and-pulling in short. These agreeable features promised to include all brutality save gouging, which was unfashionable so far to the north. But a man could not live quietly on the frontier without showing to such ruffians that his hands could shield his head. For the honor of the store, the clerk had to stand up to the opponent. The bout came off. In the first attack, Lincoln lifted the foe, though heavier, clean off his feet, but he was unable to lay him down in the orthodox manner, consisting in placing him flat on his back with both shoulder blades denting the earth. The semi-victor amicably said, Let's quit, Jack. You see I cannot give you the fall, and you cannot give it me. The gang shouted for resumption of the sport, thinking this was a weakness of the competitor. They joined again, but Armstrong, having his doubts, resorted to foul play, kicking or legging, as the localism stands. Indignantly, Lincoln drew him up again and shook him in midair as a terrier does a rat. The rowdies, seeing their champion bested, shouted for him to make a fight of it. And probably they would have mixed in and made a fight for all in another minute. But Jack had his doubts set at rest as to the prospect of overcoming a man who could hold him out and off at arm's length, and begging to be set down, grasp his antagonist's hands in friendship and proclaimed him the best man who had ever broke into that section. The two became friends, and the gang gradually dwindled by this recession from their ranks of their Goliath. End of section 16. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 17 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Horrors for the Third Time. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. The Horrors for the Third Time When Abraham Lincoln was a poor young lawyer from Springfield, attending the perambulatory court down at Lewiston, Illinois, he found the place crowded by a Methodist meeting, as well as the court having an attractive case to try. He was obliged, because of exclusion from the inn, to put up at the sheriff's house. Mrs. Davidson herself could only offer him shares with Mr. Stephen A. Douglas, also a rising man, and Peter Cartwright, the noted preacher, on the floor, put on a feather bed. At that period, the wild goose flew low. It may be supposed that the student of Shakespeare might quote, When shall we three meet again, on rising between the famous border worthies in the dawn? The hospitality was so refreshing that the trio spent the next night there. They sat up by the large fireside, capping stories, the enmity of lawyers and even of politicians is but skin deep, and Steve and Abe clashed not at all to meet the minister's reproof. Lincoln rocked while storytelling in a cane-bottomed chair. 
taken from the steamboat celebrated in Spoon River Annals as its first navigator. Lincoln was the more interested as he had been boatman and pilot on the river, the Sangamon, in the 1820s. This toy boat, the Utility, struggled into the high water of Spoon River. It is a tributary of the Illinois. Now, though the county is named Fulton, none of the inhabitants knew anything about the inventor of steam navigation, and doubted that a steamboat existed near them. Hence the snorting, puffing, and clangor of the vessel as she surged against the freshet alarmed all the population in hearing when she ascended the virgin spoon. One Sam Jenkins had been on a spree for a week, and even he was roused by the tremendous sound as he rushed from his cabin by the terrific blaze from the huge smokestack and the furnace-burning pitch pine, he sank onto his shaking knees and yelled, Boys, I've got em for the third time. It's all up with me. End of section 17. This recording is in the public domain. Section 18 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams the whistle that stopped the boat read for LibriVox.org by esther lincoln was pitted as a lawyer against a brother of the toga who was of fat and plethoric habit and who puffed and blowed when most he wished to get on with his speech the wag said the gentleman reminds me of a little steamboat i knew on the spoon river she had been equipped with a whistle disproportionate to her capacity of steam power and every time she blew off it stopped the boat. End of section 18. This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. It is the deed, not the doer. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. It is the deed, not the doer. By one of those unaccountable contradictions which disturb one's calculation upon women's conduct, the fair sex took to him with extraordinary kindness, though he always remained shy in their presence. This favour on their part was fortified by his striking honesty in little points, which the close-seeing feminine eye never misses. To cap the climax, he defended the purity of social order with a rarity in those quarters sufficient to single him out. Not that the roughest westerner was not excessively gallant, but his restrictions in the ladies' presence did not always curb his proneness to tall talk. Once in the way, a loafer hanging about in the store and having paid only attention to the dram counter, the necessary concomitant of the village centre, became garrulous, but unfortunately more than seasoned the flow with a profanity tolerably rich in variety, if not distinguished for refinement. He was of the Carly's Grove genus, as there was a crowd in the ladies' department, that is, the dry goods and finery, where it happened Lincoln was commonly besieged. The language was resented by women's weapons, tosses of the head, affected deafness, glances into the future, and so on, but the clerk resented it in another way. He bade him be silent. Now the fellow thought with his kind that he was entitled to exhale the breath which was strengthened by the strong waters vended here, and expressed himself more foully than before. He had a resentment against the clod rising to be a flower of courtesy, and here was his opportunity to satisfy the grudge, and before an audience timid and not apt to intervene. Singularly, the men who most despise women are the ones who seek to have her applause. He wished to see the man who would stop him from uttering his sentiments. He was answered that his business would be attended to as soon as the offended ladies had withdrawn. The undesired witness took the hint and quitted the store. Thereupon the long-limbed clerk verified the taunt of counter-jumper by clearing it at a bound. Will you engage not to repeat that rowdy blackguard? talk in the store while I am the master, and leave instanter. The bully protested in a torrent of unrepeatable words. I see, said the champion of decency, you want a whipping, and I may as well give it to you as any other man. And he forthwith administered the correction, 
not only did he drag him outdoors, but laid him out so senseless that nothing less than the border finish of a knockdown and drag out encounter, the rubbing the conquered man's eyes with smart weed, revived him to beg for mercy and a drink. The victor allowed him to rise, converted his appeal into mockery by offering plain water, which the brute applied solely to his doubly inflamed eyes, and sent him away in tears. But the shock had a reparative effect. He became a good neighbour and a convert to temperance. This or a similar lesson to the village bully is testified to by an eyewitness of Sangamon, the resident of Viroqua, Wisconsin. His name is John White. He worked at chopping rails with the rail splitter on more than one job. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Turn out or be turned out. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. Turn out or be turned out. Superintendent Tinker of the W.U.T. says he heard Secretary Seward say to President Lincoln, Mr. President, I hear you turned out for a colored woman on a muddy crossing the other day. Did you? replied the other laughingly. Well, I don't remember it, but I always make it a rule. If people do not turn out for me, I will for them. If I didn't, there would be a collision. End of section 20. This recording is in the public domain. Section 21 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Best Thing to Take. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther. The Best Thing to Take. When Lincoln worked in and kept a grocery store. It was flanked by a groggery, and he had to supply spirits. But from that fact he saw the evils of the saloon, and early identified himself with the novel temperance movement. In 1843 he joined the Sons of Temperance. While he said he was temperate on theory, it was not so. He was practically abstinent. Not only did he lecture publicly, but at one such occasion he gave out the pledges. In decorating a boy, Cleophas Breckenridge, with a badge, after he took the pledge, he said, Sonny, that is the best thing you will ever take. End of section 21. This recording is in the public domain. Section 22 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Drinking and swallowing are two things. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. Drinking and swallowing are two things. It has been stated that Lincoln, after reigning at the village store, had become the idol of the settlement. A stranger to whom he was shown was not properly impressed. One of the clerk's friends, William Green, bragged that his favourite was the strongest man in the township. This was not affecting the critic and even went on, the strongest in the country. Hmm, not the strongest in the state, denied the stranger. I know a man who can lift a barrel of flour as easily as I can a peck of potatoes. Abe there could lift two barrels of flour if he could get a hold on them. You can beat me telling razors, but taking a lift out of you or not, I am willing to bet that Abe will lift a barrel of spirits and drink out of the bunghole to prove he can hold it there. Impossible. What will you lay on the thing? They made a wager of a new hat, the Sunday hat of beaver being still costly. Green was betting on Fairley, on a sure thing, as he had seen his friend do what he asserted, all but the drinking flourish. Lincoln was averse to the wagering at all, but to help his friend to the hat, he consented to the feat. He passed through it, lifting the cask between his two hands and holding the spigot hole to his lips, while he imbibed a mouthful. As he was slowly lowering the barrel to the floor, the winner exclaimed jubilantly, I knew you would do it, but I never knew you to drink whiskey before. The barrel was stood on the floor when the drinker calmly expelled the mouthful of its contents and drolly remarked, And I have not drunk that, you see. As a return for his action to win the hat, 
he asked Green not to wager any more, a resolve which he took to oblige him. End of section 22. This recording is in the public domain. Section 23 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Worsted in a Horse Trade. Read for LibriVox.org by Captain Allegra. Until Lincoln, seeing that his decisions created enemies, whichever way they fell, renounced being umpire for horse racing and the like events, momentous on the border, he officiated in many such pastimes. Before he found them all wrong, he had a horsey acquaintance in a judge. This was at a time when he was practicing law, which involved riding on circuit, as the court went round to give sittings, like the ancient English justices, attending assizes. During such excursions, they played practical jokes, naturally. Among their singular contests was a bet of $25, as forfeit if, in horse-swapping, the loser rejected the horse offered on even terms with the one he put in. Neither was to know anything of the equine paragon until simultaneously exhibited. As good sport was indicated where two such errant jokers were in conflict, a vast throng filled the tavern-yard where the pair were to draw conclusions. At the appointed hour the court functionary dragged upon the scene a most dilapidated simulacrum of man's noblest conquest, blind, spavined, lean as Pharaoh's kind, creaking in every joint, at the same time as his fellow wagerer carried on under his long arm a carpenter's horse, gashed with adze and broad axe, bored with the aguar, trenched with saw and draw knife, singed paint and tar spotted, crazy in each leg of the three still adhering, in short, justifying Lincoln to reverse his cry at viewing the real animal. Judge! for judge. This is the first time I ever got the worst of it in a hoss trade. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. How many short breaths. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. How many short breaths. In the nearest town to the Lincolns lived a man called Captain Larkins. He was short and fat, and consequently puffing. He was logically fond of blowing. For example, if he bought any object, he would proclaim that it was the best article of its sort in the settlement. His favourite orating ground, in fact, the only theatre for displays, was the front of the village store, where, among the farmers who came into the dicker and purchase stores, he would die late. Lincoln did not like the pompous little fellow, whose rotund and diminutive figure was in glaring contrast to his own, a young man, but colossal, while his stature was augmented by his meagerness. Gentlemen, bawled Larkins, I have the best horse in the county. I ran him three miles in two forty each, and he never fetched a long breath. Hmm, interrupted Lincoln, looking down at the man panting with excitement. Why don't you tell us how many short breaths you drew? End of section 24. This recording is in the public domain. Section 25 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's Height Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman One of the committee appointed to acquaint Mr. Lincoln formally with the decision of the Chicago Presidential Convention of 1860 was Judge Kelly, a man of unusual stature. At the meeting with the nominee he eyed the latter with admiration, and the jealousy the exceptional cherish for rivals. This had not escaped the curious Lincoln. He asked him, as he singled him out, What is your height? Six feet three. What is yours? Six feet four. Footnote. This will probably never be exactly settled now. Speaker Reed agreed with this statement, but Miss Emma Gurley Adams, in a position to know, 
published in the New York press. Mr. Lincoln told my father that he was exactly six feet three inches. This was at the end of his life. The contrariety of the assertions simply baffles one. Then, sir, Pennsylvania bows to Illinois, responded the judge. My dear sir, for years my heart has been aching for a president I could look up to, and I have found him at last in the land where we thought there were none but little giants. Stephen Douglas, leader of the Democratic Party, was a pocket Daniel Webster, and bearing the by-name of the Little Giant. End of section 25. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 26 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Measures and Men. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. Measures and Men. The earlier audiences at the White House were inspired by ludicrous ideas, far between patriotism and interest in the tall hosier. The habitual attendants and guests soon discovered that the chief was an unrivalled host, adapting modes of reception to the differing kinds of callers. He noticed once two young men who hung about the door, so that, sympathizing with the shy, for he had been woefully troubled by that feeling in his youth, he went over to the pair, and to make them feel at home, asked them to be seated while they looked on. But they didn't care for chairs. The shorter of the two stammered that he and his friend had a talk about the President's unusual height, and would the host kindly settle the matter, and see whether he were as tall as His Excellency. Lincoln had been scanning the competitor, and smiling, returned, "'He is long enough, certainly. Let us see about that.' He went for his cane. Footnote. Lincoln's cane. This was the cane he carried instead of going armed, but he was forever leaving it anywhere about, so that nine times out of ten he went forth without it on his errand, browsing around, and it was a wonder that this time he knew where to find it and placing the ferrule end to the wall to act as a level, he bade the young man draw near and stand under. When the rod was carefully adjusted to the top of the head, Mr. Lincoln continued, Now step out and hold the cane while I go under. This comparison showed that the young man stood six feet three exactly, Lincoln's precise figure too. Just my height! remarked the affable president to the herald of the match. He guessed with admirable accuracy. Giving both a shake of the hand, he gave them the good-bye warmly. He had seen that they were innocents, and shrank from letting them know that they had unconsciously offended his dignity. End of section 26. This recording is in the public domain. Section 27 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Prize for Homeliness Read for LibriVox.org by Jeremiah Britt The Prize for Homeliness In keeping with his proneness to jest at his own expense rather than lose a laugh, Lincoln is credited with telling the following story upon himself. In the days when I used to be on the circuit, law. I was accosted on the road by a stranger. He said, Excuse me, sir, but I have an article in my possession which belongs to you. How is that? I asked, considerably astonished. The stranger took a barlow from his pocket. This knife, said he, was placed in my hands some years ago with the injunction of the community, through its bearer, that I was to keep it until I struck a man homelier than I. I have carried it from that time till this. Allow me to say, sir, that you are fairly entitled to the testimonial. End of section 27. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 28 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams How Long Legs Should Be Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg How Long Legs Should Be A quipster, harping on Mr. Lincoln's abnormal tallness, had the mishap to draw upon himself some quizzing, the president putting the nonplus on him by asking, How long, then, ought a man's legs to be? The answer was given by the Sphinx. Long enough to reach from his body to the ground. End of section 28. This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Long Meter. Read for LibriVox.org. John Sherman will be remembered as originator of the politician's cover for electioneering activity, I am going home to mend my fences. He was fresh from Ohio, but he included in his round of duties, on visiting the Capitol, an attendance of a Lincoln reception. He waited in the long file for his turn to shake hands, and while doing so, wondered how he would be received. For the informal function was enlivened by the most untoward incidents, due to the host's simplicity, spontaneous acts and words, and the home-like nature of the scene. Truly enough, when his chance came, the meeting was eccentric. Lincoln scanned him a moment, threw out his large hand, and said, "'You're a pretty tall fellow, aren't you? Stand up here to me back to back, and let's see which of us two is the taller.' In another moment I was standing back to back with the greatest man of his age. Naturally I was quite abashed by this unexpected evidence of democracy." "'You are from the West, aren't you?' inquired Lincoln. "'My home is in Ohio,' I replied. "'I thought so,' he said. "'That's the kind of men they raise out there.'" End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Hardships Strengthen Muscles as in the old country, kings evade the tiresome features of receptions, after a time, by retiring and leaving the ceremony to be carried out by a deputy, so the daintier presidents before the sixteenth one eluded the handshaking when possible. But, on the contrary, the man out of the West continued to the last, and the latest visitor had no reason to cavil at the grip being less hearty to him than the first comer. On visiting the army hospital at City Point, where upward of three thousand patients awaited his passing with enrapt respect, he insisted on no one being neglected. A surgeon inquired if he did not feel lamed in the arm by the undue exertion, whereupon he replied smilingly, Not at all. The hardships of my early life gave me strong muscles. And as there happened to be in the yard by the doorway a chopping block with the axe left stuck on the top as usual, he took it out, swung, and poised it to get the unfamiliar heft, and chopped up a stick lying handy. When he paused, from no more left to do, he held out the implement straight, forming one line with his extended arm, and not a nerve quivered any more than the helve or the blade. The workers, who knew what hard work was, gazed with wonder at what they could not have done for a moment. One of them gathered up the chips and disposed of them for relics to the sightseers who welcomed such tokens of the great ruler. An American visiting Mr. Gladstone's country seat, Hawarden, and seeing the premier chopping a tree for health's sake, observed humorously, having also seen Mr. Lincoln employed as above, Your grand old man is going in at the same hole ours went out. End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. He used to be good on the chop. Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots. In the beginning of 1865, the President was wont to pay visits to the James River, not merely to inspect the camps and the field hospitals, but to have a peep at the promised land that is, Richmond, still held by the rapidly melting and discouraged Southerners as the last ditch. In one of his strolls, he came upon a gang of lumbermen, cutting up logs and putting up stockades and cabins for the wet weather. Joining one group, he chatted freely with the woodman and as one of themselves. Presently, he asked for the loan of an axe. 
the man hesitating since his blade had just been fine-edged he explained that he was one of the jacks and used to be good on the chop and seizing the arm with familiarity he attacked a big log and using it as a broad axe shaped the rough hewn sides till it was a perfect slab he handed back the tool and stalked off amid cheers end of recording end of section 31 this recording is in the public domain Section 32 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Man Who Can Scratch His Shins Without Stooping Read for LibriVox.org One of the want-to-knows had the impertinence to inquire of Mr. Lincoln his opinion of General Sheridan, not yet known, who had come out of the West early in 1864, to take command of the cavalry under General Grant as Lieutenant General. "'Have you not seen Sheridan?' The answer was in the negative. "'Then I will tell you just what kind of a chap he is.' one of those long-armed fellows with short legs that can scratch their shins without having to stoop over to do it. End of section 32. This recording is in the public domain. Section 33 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Struck by the Dead Hand Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell Struck by the Dead Hand Edwin Booth, the tragedian, brother of the regicide Wilkes, was at a friend's house. By the purest chance, dulling over the knick-knacks, he picked up a plaster cast of a hand. It was something more than a paperweight, he was intuitively prompted for, he said, handling it as reverently as Yorick's relict. By the way, whose is this? Before the cue could be given to hush or utter a subterfuge, someone blurted out, Abraham Lincoln's, don't you know? The murder was out, and the distinguished guest who suffered a long term for a crime wholly out of his ken was silent for the evening. W. D. Howells End of section 33 This recording is in the public domain. Section 34 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. This clinches it. Read for LibriVox.org. A party accompanying the President to the ground to see experiments with new ordnance in the Navy Yard, in 1862, were diverted by his taking a ship's carpenter's axe from its nick in a spar, and holding it out by the end of the handle, a feat that none of the group could imitate. He said that he had had enough of the Dahl Greens, Columbiads, and Raphael Repeaters, and that this was an American institution, which, I guess, I understand better than all other weapons. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's First Love Story Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman in 1833, when Abraham was just over twenty, he fell in love with Anne, or Annie Rutledge, at New Salem. Her father kept the tavern where Lincoln boarded, but the girl was engaged to a dry goods merchant named McNeil. This man, pretending to be of a high old Irish family, likely to discountenance union to a publican's daughter, shilly shallied but finally went east to get his folk's consent. He acknowledged that he was parading under borrowed plumes, as he was a McNamara in reality. He stayed away so long that the maid, forlorn, gave him up and listened to other suitors. Lincoln proposed, but waited till the apparent jilt was heard from. Then they were espoused but a block to the match came in Lincoln having no position. Awaiting his efforts as a law student, the wedding was postponed. But meanwhile, death came quick where fortune lagged. She died and left her lover broken-hearted. He seems then to have been smitten with the brown study afflicting him all his life, and by some, like Secretary Boutwell, affirmed to be independent of the surrounding grounds for depression and grief. Fears of suicide led his friends to watch him closely, and he was known to go and lie on the grave of the maid, 
whose name he said would dwell ever with him, while his heart was buried with her. The rival McNamara returned too late to redeem his vow, but lived in the same state many years, a prosperous gentleman. End of section 35 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 36 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Put-Up Job or Chance Read for LibriVox.org The ways of the petitioner are deep and mysterious. The Virginian, Illinois, Inquirer, March 1, 1879, had the following. John McNamara, Namara, was buried last Saturday near Petersburg, Menard County. He was an early settler and carried on business at New Salem. Abe Lincoln was the postmaster there and kept a store. It was here that, at the tavern, dwelt the fair Annie Rutledge, in whose grave Lincoln wrote that his heart was buried. As the story runs, the fair and gentle Annie was John's sweetheart, but Abe took a shine to her, and succeeded in heading off Mac, and won her affections. During the war, a Kentucky lady went to Washington with her daughter to procure her son's pardon for being a gorilla. The daughter was a musician. Sitting at the piano while her mother was sewing, she sang, Gentle Annie. While it was being charmingly rendered, Abe rose from his seat, crossed the room to a window, and gazed out for several minutes with that sad, far-away look noticed as one of his particularities. When he returned to his seat he wrote a note which, as he said, was the pardon besought. The scene proves that Mr. Lincoln was a man of fine feelings, and that if the occurrence was a put-up job on the lady's part, it accomplished the purpose all the same. End of section 36. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Marriage. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. Footnote. Addressing Kentuckians in a speech made at Cincinnati in 1859, Lincoln said, we mean to marry our girls when we have a chance, and I have the honor to say I once did have a chance in that way. End of footnote. In 1839, another Kentucky belle arrived in Illinois to follow the steps of her sister, who had found a conquest there. This Mrs. Edwards introduced Miss Mary Todd, and she became the belle of the Sangamon Bottom. Lincoln was pitted against another young lawyer, afterward the eminent Stephen A. Douglas, but, odd as it appears, Miss Todd singled out the ugly duckling as the more eligible of the two. Whatever the reason, strange in a man knowing how to bide his time to win, Lincoln wrote to the lady, withdrawing from the contest, allowed to be hopeless by him. His friend Speed would not bear the letter, but pressed him to have a face-to-face -face explanation. The rogue, who was in the toils himself and was shortly wedded, believed the parley would remove the, perhaps, imaginary hindrance. But Miss Todd accepted the deliverance. Thereupon they parted. But immediately the reconciliation took place. The nuptials were settled, but here again Lincoln displayed a waywardness utterly out of keeping with his subsequent actions. He bolted on the wedding day, New Year's, 1841. Searching for him, his friends, remembering the fit after the Rutledge death, found him in the woods like the passionate pilgrim of ancient romance. Luckily he was inspirited by them with a feeling that an irrepressible desire to live till assured that the world is a little better for my having lived in it. Seeing what ensued, one could say then, good speed, to his bosom friend of that name. But his friend married in the next year, and in his cold loneliness so doubled, Lincoln harked back to the flame. She ought never to have forgiven him for the slight, but it was not possible for her to repay him with poetic justice by rejoicing Stephen A. Douglas, as that gentleman had looked elsewhere for matrimonial recompense. Lincoln and Miss Todd, in 1842, renewed the old plight, and never again were divided. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Section 38 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. 
The Burlesque Duel, read for LibriVox.org. Lincoln was plunged willy-nilly into the society he shunned at home, on entering the legislature at Springfield. A newspaper there published the account, from her side, of a young lady's difference with a noted politician, General James Shields. He married a sister of Lincoln's wife, and there was a feud between them. Shields flew to the editor to demand the name of the maligner, as he called the correspondent, or the editor must meet him with a dueling weapon, or his horsewhip. In the western states the whip was snapped at literary men as the cane was flourished in England at the date, 1842. The editor consulted with Lincoln as a lawyer and a friend. With his enmity as to Shields, the friend promptly advised him to say, I did it. This was, in fact, sheer justice, for it was Lincoln's wife who uttered the articles. And, by the way, their style and rustic humor were much in the vein of the Widow Badeau and the Samantha papers of later times. Mrs. Lincoln was not the mere housekeeper the scribes accuse her of being. Lincoln knew what was her value when he read his speeches first to her for an opinion, as Moliere courted his stewardess for opinions. Sumner heeded her counsel. Abraham championed the mysterious Aunt Becca, who had characterized Shields as a ballroom dandy floating around without heft or substance, just like a lot of cat fur where cats have been fighting. Is this not quite Lincolnian? Thus put forward, Lincoln received a challenge. Trial by battle, personal, still ruled. The politicians coupled with the necessity of going out with weapons to maintain an assertion in speech or publication were Jefferson Davis, Jackson, the President, Henry Clay, the Amiable, Sam Houston, Sergeant S. Prentice, etc. Shields naturally challenged the ladies' champion. As the challenged party, Lincoln, who had cooled in the interim, not only chose broadswords, not at all the gentleman's arm in an affair of honor, but, what is more, descanted on the qualities of the cutlass in such a droll manner, and words, that the second went off laughing. He imparted his unseemly mirth to his opponent's seconds, and all the parties concerned took the cue to soften down the irritation between the two persons formerly chums and relatives so close. The meeting took place by the riverside out of Alton, where the leaking out of the gallantry of Lincoln in taking up the cudgels for the lady led to an explanation, although no such enlightenment ought to be permitted on the ground. Besides, all was ludicrous, the broadswords intolerably broad. The principals shook hands, but the plotters were not content with this peaceful ending. They had determined that the outside spectators on the town side of the river should be in at the sham death. They rigged up a log in a coat and sheet, like a man wounded and reclining in the bottom of a boat, and pretended it was one of the duelists, badly stricken, whom they were escorting to town for surgical assistance. The explosion of laughter receiving the two principals when the hoax was revealed caused the incident to be a sore point to both Lincoln and Shields. End of section 38 This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Wanting to Dance the Worst Way Read for LibriVox.org by Kidder A Miss Mary Todd had come to visit a sister married in the neighborhood of Springfield. Lincoln was there as a member of the legislature sitting. He had eschewed society, though he liked it, in favor of study, but now rewarded himself for achieving this fruit of application by joining the movements around him. He made the acquaintance of Miss Todd, vivacious, sprightly, keenly incited so as to divine he would prove superior in fate to Stephen Douglas, also courting her. Although unsuited by nature and his means to shine in the ballroom, Lincoln followed his flame thither. Using the vernacular, he asked for her hand, saying earnestly, Miss Todd, I should like to dance with you the worst way. After he had led his partner to her seat, a friend asked how the clumsy partner had carried himself. He kept his word. He did dance the worst way. End of section 39. This recording is in the public domain. Section 40 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The statute fixes all that. Even Lincoln's marriage was to be accompanied by a diversion of that merry imp of incongruity always with him, as Shakespeare's most stately heroes are attended by a comic servant. 
He married Miss Mary Dodd of Kentucky at Springfield at the age of thirty-three. It was the first wedding performed with all the ceremonial of the Episcopalian sect. This was to the awe of the Honorable Judge Tom C. Brown, an old man and friend and patron of our Abraham. He watched the ecclesiastical functionary to the point of Lincoln's placing the ring on the bride's finger, when the irate old stager exclaimed at the formula, With this ring I thee endow all my goods, etc. Grace to Goshen! Lincoln, the statute fixes all that! End of section 40. This recording is in the public domain. Section 41 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. He did not know his own house. Read for LibriVox.org. In 1842, Abraham Lincoln married Miss Mary Todd, a Kentucky lady, at Springfield, where he took a house for the wedded life. Previously, while qualifying for the bar, he had dwelt for study over a furniture store. On account of his attending the traveling court, which compelled a horse, since he could not afford the gig associated with the chief lawyer's degree of respectability, he was frequently and for long periods away from home. In one of these absences his wife deemed it fit for his coming dignity of pleader to have a second story and a roof of a fashionable type set upon the old foundations. Under a fresh coat of paint, too, this renovation perplexed the homecomer when he drew up on his horse before it. At the sound of the horse's steps he knew that someone was flying to the parlour window, but affecting amazement he challenged a passer-by, "'Neighbour, I feel like a stranger here. Can you tell me where Abraham Lincoln lives? He used to live here.' End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Only One Who Dared Pull Wool Over Lincoln's Eyes Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The Only One Who Dared Pull Wool Over Lincoln's Eyes while Mr. Lincoln was living in Springfield, a judge of the city, who was one of the leading and most influential citizens of the place, had occasion to call upon him. Mr. Lincoln was not over-particular in his matter of dress, and was also careless in his manners. The judge was ushered into the parlour, where he found Mr. Lincoln sprawled out across a couple of chairs, reclining at his ease. The judge was asked to be seated, and, without changing his position in the least, Mr. Lincoln entered into conversation with his visitor. While the two men were talking, Mrs. Lincoln entered the room. She was, of course, greatly embarrassed at Mr. Lincoln's off-hand manner of entertaining his caller, and stepping up behind her husband, she grasped him by the hair and twitched his head about, at the same time looking at him reprovingly. Mr. Lincoln apparently did not notice the rebuke. He simply looked up at his wife, then across at the judge, and without rising said, "'Little Mary, allow me to introduce you to my friend, Judge So-and-So.' It will be remembered that Mrs. Lincoln's maiden name was Mary Todd, and that she was very short in stature. Leslie's Monthly. End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Long and Short of It, read for LibriVox.org by Megan Conkle. The Long and Short of It. The contrast between the statures of the Lincolns, man and wife, was palpable, but this hardly substantiates the story of the President appearing with his wife on the White House porch in response to a serenade, and his saying, Here I am, and here is Mrs. Lincoln. That's the long and short of it. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. All a man wants. Twenty thousand dollars. Read for LibriVox.org. In one of his messages to Congress, the President foretold and denounced the tendency of wealth acquired in masses and rapidly by the war contractors and the like as approaching despotism. He saw liberty attacked in the effort to place capital on an equal footing with, if not above, labor in the structure of government. It is never to be forgotten that neither he nor his cabinet officers were ever upbraided for corruption. Some, like Secretary Stanton, though handling enormous sums, died poor men comparatively. Footnote. It is true that Lincoln's first war minister, Simon Cameron, was accused of smoothing the way to certain fat war contracts, 
a wit suggesting simony as the term, but no charges were really brought. Lincoln said that if one proof were forthcoming, he would have the Cameronian head, but Mr. Cameron died intact. End note. It is in accordance with this honesty of the honest old Abe rule that he said to an old friend whom he met in New York in 1859, "'How have you fared since you left us?' The merchant gleefully replied that he had made a hundred thousand dollars in business, and lost it all, with the reflection of Lincoln's and the Western cool humor. "'How is it on your part?' "'Oh, very well. I have the cottage at Springfield and about eight hundred dollars.' If they make me vice-president with Seward, as some will say they will, I hope I shall be able to increase it to twenty thousand. That is as much as any man ought to want. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. I'll Hit the Thing Hard. Read for LibriVox.org by Captain Allegra. In Coffin's Lincoln, it is stated that when Lincoln and Offutt, boating to New Orleans, attended a slave auction for the first time, the former said to his companion, By the Eternal, if I ever get a chance to hit this thing, I'll hit it hard. The oath was General President Jackson's, and familiar as a household word at the day. The promise is premature in a youth of twenty. Herndon, twenty-five years associated with Lincoln, doubts, but says that Lincoln did allude to some such utterance. But it is Dennis Hanks, cousin of Lincoln, who affirms that they too saw such a sight, and that he knew by his companion's emotion that the iron had entered into his soul. In 1841, Lincoln and Speed had a tedious low-water trip from Louisville to St. Louis. Lincoln says, There were on board ten or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continual torment to me, a thing which has, and continually exercises, the power of making me miserable. But his acts show that he hit the thing hard. It could not recover from the telling stroke which rent the black oak, the Emancipation Act. End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Lex Talians Christianized. Read for LibriVox.org. Frederick Douglass, the colored men's representative, called on the President to procure a pledge that the unfair treatment of Negro soldiers in the Union uniform should cease by retaliatory measures on the captured Confederates. But his hearers shrank from the bare thought of hanging men in cold blood, even though the rebels should slay the Negroes taken. Oh, Douglas, I cannot do that. If I could get hold of the actual murderers of colored prisoners, I would retaliate. But to hang those who have had no hand in the atrocities, I cannot do that. By F. Douglas in Northwestern Advocate. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Slave Dealer. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. You have among you the class of native tyrants known as the slave-dealer. He watches your necessities, and crawls up to buy your slave at a speculating price. If you cannot help it, you sell to him. But if you can help it, you drive him from your door. You despise him utterly. You do not recognize him for a friend, or even as an honest man. Your children must not play with his. They may rollick freely with the little negroes, but not with the slave-dealer's children. If you are obliged to deal with him, you try to go through the job without so much as touching him. It is common with you to join hands with the men you meet, but with the slave-dealer you avoid the ceremony, instinctively shrinking from the snaky contact. If he grows rich and retires from business, you still remember him, and still keep up the ban of not intercourse with him and his family. Those who deny the poor negro's natural right to himself, and make mere merchandise of him, deserve kickings, contempt, and death. Speech. Reply to Douglas, Peoria, Illinois, October 16, 1854. End of section 47. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 48 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Negro Home or Agitation Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman Lincoln was admitted to the law practice in 1837. He went into partnership with John F. Stewart. The latter elected to Congress, he united his legal talents with S.T. Logan's, a union severed in 1843, as both the associates were aiming to be congressmen also. Not being nominated, the consolation was in the courts, with Judge Herndon as partner. It was from this daily frequentation that the latter was enabled to write A Life of Lincoln. An old colored woman came to them for legal aid. Her case was a sad one. Brought from Kentucky, Lincoln's natal state, by a planter Hinkle, he had set her and her children free in Indiana, not fostering the waning oppression. Her son, growing up, had the rashness to venture on the steamboat down to New Orleans. His position was as bad as that of an Americanized foreigner returning into the despotic land. He was arrested and held for sale, having crossed a Louisiana law framed for such intrusions. A free Negro could be sold here, as if never out of bond. There was little time to redeem him, and Lincoln, whose view of the institution had not been enchanting, seized the opportunity to hit, and hit hard, as he said in the same city, on beholding a slave sale. The office was in Springfield, the capital, and the state house was over the way. While Lincoln continued to question and console the poor sufferer, his partner went over to learn of the governor what he could do in the matter but there was no constitutional or even legal right to interfere with the doings of a sovereign state. This omission as regards humanity stung Lincoln, always tender on that score, and he excitedly vowed, By virtue of freedom for all, I will have that Negro back, or a twenty years' agitation in Illinois, which will afford its governor a legal and constitutional right to interfere in such premises. The only way to rescue the unfortunate young man was to make up a purse and recompense a correspondent at the city below, to obtain the captive and return him to his mother. Such cases, of more often fugitive slave matters, were not uncommon in the state. Lincoln was already linked with the ultras on the question, so that it was said by lawyers applied to, afraid as political aspirants, Go to that Lincoln, the liberator. He will defend a fugitive slave case. End of section 48. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 49 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Vow. Read for LibriVox.org by Harold Stewart. On the 17th of September, 1862, the Confederate inroad into Maryland was stopped by the decisive defeat of Antietam, and the raiders were sent to the retreat. Lincoln called the cabinet to a special meeting and stated that the time had come at last for the proclamation of freedom to the slaves everywhere in the United States. Public sentiment would now sustain, after great vacillation, and all his friends were bent upon it. Besides, I promised my God I would do it. Yea, I made a solemn vow before God that, if General Lee was driven back from Pennsylvania, I would crown the result by the declaration of freedom to the slave. It was remarked that the signature appeared tremulous and uneven, but the writer affirmed that that was not because of any uncertainty or hesitation on my part. It was done after the public reception, and three hours handshaking is not calculated to improve a man's chirography. He said to the painter of the Signing the Emancipation Act, Mr. Carpenter, I believe that I am about as glad over the success of this work as you are. The original was destroyed in the great fire at Chicago, where it was under exhibition. The pan and the table concerned should be in the Lincoln Museum. 
the inkstand was a wooden one, in private hands, and bought at public sale when Lincoln relics were not at the current high price. End of section 49. This recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Do not take to the woods. Read for LibriVox.org by Andra Hoots. Secretary Seward, as manager of the foreign relations, met much trouble from the disposition of the aristocratic realms of Europe to await eagerly for a breach by which to enter into interference without quarreling. He was also a great troublemaker, having the innate repugnance of men of letters and voice to play second fiddle, since he was nominated to the trial ballot above Lincoln in the presidential convention. The black speck in the political horizon was San Domingo. The abolitionists wanted to help her to attain liberty, in which case Mother Spain would assuredly come out openly against the United States and consequently ally with the Confederacy. The statement of the dilemma, side with Spain or the Black Republic, reminded the President of a Negro story quite akin. A colored parson was addressing his hearers and drew a dreadful picture of the sinner in distress. He had two courses before him, however but the exhorter asserted in a gush of novelty that this narrow way leads on to destruction and that broad into damnation feeling he was overshooting the mark by the dismay among his congregation he paused when an impulsive brother started up with bristling wool and staring eyes and making for the door hallooed in that case this child he takes to the woods mr president elucidated the black prospect I am not willing to assume any new responsibilities at this juncture. I shall, therefore, avoid going to the one place with Spain, or with the Negro to the other, but shall take to the woods. A strict and honest neutrality was therefore observed, and San Domingo is still a bone of contention, though not with Spain, for it is an eye on our canal. End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Section 51 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Unpardonable Crime Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman The mass of examples of Lincoln's leniency, mercifulness, and lack of rigor lead one to believe that he could not be inexorable. But there was one crime to which he was unforgiving the truckling to slavery. The smuggling of slaves into the South was carried on much later than a guileless public imagine. Only fifty years ago, a slave trader languished in a Massachusetts prison, in Newburyport, serving out a five-year sentence, and still confined from inability to procure the thousand dollars to pay a superimposed fine. Mr. Alley, congressman of Lynn, felt compassion and busied himself to try to procure the wretch's release. For that, he laid the unfortunate's petition before President Lincoln. It acknowledged the guilt and the justice of his condemnation. He was penitent and deplored his state. All had fallen away from him after his conviction. The chief arbiter was touched by the piteous and emphatic appeal. Nevertheless, he felt constrained to say to the intermediary, my friend, this is a very touching appeal to my feelings. You know that my weakness is to be, if possible, too easily moved by appeals to mercy. And if this man were guilty of the foulest murder that the arm of man could perpetrate, I might forgive him on such an appeal. But the man who could go to Africa and rob her of her children and sell them into interminable bondage, with no other motive than that which is furnished by dollars and cents, is so much worse than the most depraved murderer that he can never receive pardon at my hands. No, he may rot in jail before he shall have liberty by any act of mine. End of section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman.
Section 52 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Beyond the Boon Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman The other slave trade case is more tragic than the above. It roused much excitement, as the conviction for slave trading was the first under the special law in any part of the land. The object of the unique process was William Gordon, sentenced to be hanged like a pirate, the most prodigious effort was made to have the penalty relaxed with a prospect that the term of imprisonment would be curtailed as soon as decent. It would seem that merchant princes were connected with the lucrative, if nefarious, traffic in which he was a captain. But the offense was so flagrant that the New York District Attorney went to Washington to block mistaken clemency. He was all but too late, for the President had literally under his hand the Gordon reprieve. The powerful influence reached even into the executive study. Lawyer Delafield Smith stood firmly upon the need of making an example, and Mr. Lincoln gave way, but in despair at having to lay aside the pen and redoom the miserable tool to the gallows where he was executed at New York. Mr. Smith, sighed the President, you do not know how hard it is to have a human being die when you know a stroke of your pen may save him. End of section 52 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 53 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Vain is the Pope's Bull against the Comet. Read for LibriVox.org. The potency of the Emancipation Act was so patent to the least politician that, long before 1863, when its announcement opened the memorable year for freedom, not only had its demonstration had been implored by his friends, but some of his subordinates had tried to launch its lightning with not so impersonal a sentiment. To a religious body, Pressing him to verify his title of abolitionist, he replied, I do not want to issue a document that the whole world will see must necessarily be inoperative, like the Pope's bull against the comet. End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Section 54 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams a volunteer captaincy worth two dollars. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell. A volunteer captaincy worth two dollars. While he was a lumberer, Lincoln was in the employ of one Kirkpatrick, who ran a sawmill. In hiring the new man, the employer had promised to buy him a dog or cant hook of sufficient size to suit a man of uncommon stature. But he failed in his pledge, and would not give him the two dollars of its value for his working without the necessary tool. Though far from a grudging disposition, Lincoln cherished this in memory. When the Black Hawk War broke out and the governor called out volunteers, Sangamon County straightway responded and raised a company of rangers. This Kirkpatrick wished and strove to be elected captain, but Lincoln recited his grievance to the men and said to his friend William Green, or green? Bill, I believe I can now make even with Kirkpatrick for the two dollars he owes me for the cant hook. Setting himself up for candidate, he won the post. It was a triumph of popularity which rejoiced him. As late as 1860, he said he had not met since that success any to give him so much satisfaction. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Getting the Company Column Through Endwise Read for LibriVox.org Captain Lincoln was drilling his men, marching the twenty or so by the front, when he found himself before a gap in the fence through which he wanted to go. He says, I could not for the life of me remember the proper words of command, by the right flank, file left, march, Hardy's tactics, forgetting my company endwise so that it could get through the gateway, as we came near the passage I shouted, "'Company halt! Break ranks! You are dismissed for two minutes, when you will fall in again on the other side of the gap.' 
End of section 55. This recording is in the public domain. Section 56 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Regular and Irregular. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell. Regular and Irregular. In the Black Hawk War, Captain Lincoln came to cross purposes with the regular army commissariat. The latter insisted on the fare and under the service of the army being superior to what the Bucktail Rangers got. The latter, however, were empowered by the governor to forage rather freely, so that the settlers were said to fear more for their fowls through their protectors than from the Indians for their scalps. Once, when Lincoln's corps were directed to perform some duty which he did not think accrued to them, he did it. But he went to the army officer to whom he reported and said plainly, Sir, you forget that we are not under the orders and regulations of the War Department at Washington, but are simply volunteers under those of the Governor of Illinois. Keep in your own sphere, and there will be no difficulty. But resistance will be made to your unjust orders. Further, my men must be equal in all particulars to the regular army. William Green, who was in the Rangers. End of section 56. This recording is in the public domain. Section 57 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Knowing when to give in. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. If you will refer to the table of the presidents, you will see that Lincoln's origin is set down as English, but with the noted English love of fair play is coupled the art of not knowing when a man is beaten. This descendant of John Bull differs from his ancestors on this head. During the Black Hawk War, the soldiers in camp entertained themselves by athletic contests. The captain of the Sangamon Company excelled all the others, regulars and volunteers, in bodily pastimes. This induced the men to challenge all the army, pitting Lincoln against the whole field, one down to other come up. A man of another regiment named Thompson appeared, with whom the preliminary tussle to feel the enemy gave Lincoln a belief that he had tackled more than he could pull off this time. He intimated as much to his backers, who, with true western wholesoledness, were betting not only all their money, but their possibles and equipment. Disbelieving him, though he had never shown the white feather, the first bout did terminate disastrously for Illinois. Lincoln was clearly downed. The next, or settling bout, ended the same way. Only Lincoln's supporters would not see, and refused to pay up their bets. The whole company was about to lock horns on the decision when Captain Lincoln spoke up. Boys, Thompson threw me fair and clean, and he did the same the next time, but not so clearly. In peace or in war, it was always the same honest Abe of Sangamon. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Section 58 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Fruitful Speech Read for LibriVox.org by Christine A Fruitful Speech At the age of twenty, Lincoln was studying law in off hours, and used to walk over to Booneville, ten or twelve miles, the county court center, to watch how law proceedings were conducted. He was interested in one murder case, ably defended by John Breckenridge. In fact, Lincoln, hanging round the courtroom doors to see the lawyers come out, was impelled by his ingenious admiration to hail him and say, That was the best speech I ever heard. The advocate was naturally surprised at this frank outburst of the simple country lad. Years afterward, Breckenridge, footnote, not the ex-vice president and confederate cabinet officer of that name, end of footnote. Belonging to Texas, and having been an active confederate, was in the position to implore the executive's clemency. It was granted him 
while the donor reminded him of the far-off incident, which he still insisted included the best speech I ever heard. The beneficiary might have retorted that the plea for his own pardon was, in his mind, more effective in sparing a life. End of section 58. This recording is in the public domain. Section 59 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A Captain Challenged by His Men. Read for LibriVox.org. At the outset of the Black Hawk War, an outbreak of Indians in Illinois, the popularity of Abraham Lincoln induced the young men of the Sangamon Valley, in forming a company of mounted riflemen, to vote him as their captain. The forces were very irregular irregulars, did no fighting as a body, and were insubordinate to the last. Once it was in an ironically amusing manner. The captain had saved a friendly Indian from a beating, that being General Cass's order, as well as what humanity prompted, though at the same time there had been Indian tragedy in his own family, and he had the racial Indian hatred in his blood. The mutineers threatened to still shoot the captive. "'Not unless you shoot me,' rejoined the taunted commander. The men recoiled, but one voiced the general sentiment in. "'This is cowardly on your part, Lincoln, presuming on your rank. "'If any of you think that, let him test it here and now,' was the reply, equally as oblivious of military decorum. But they flinched, for he was larger and lustier than anybody else. "'You can level up,' he said, guessing their reasoning. "'Choose your own weapons.' The more sane roared with laughter at this monstrous offer on the superior's part, and the good feeling was renewed between chief and file. End of section 59. This recording is in the public domain. Section 60 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams General McClellan's Opinion of Lincoln as a Lawyer Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell The whirligig of time brings about strange revenges for a truth. General McClellan was chosen to visit the seat of the Crimean War to study the siege operations about Sebastopol. Returning and seeing no prospects in the air of his professional line, he became superintendent of the Illinois Central Railroad Company. He was acting for its president in December 1855, when a bill was laid under his eyes. It was the demand of Abraham Lincoln of the law firm of Lincoln and Herndon, Springfield, Illinois. The firm had offered in October to act for the company to defend a suit brought by McLean County. Lincoln had won it. To prevent any demur about the fee of $1,000, a fourth of that having been paid for the retainer, he had six members of the bar append their names to testify the charge was usual and just. Nevertheless, Superintendent McClellan refused to pay, alleging that this is as much as a first-class lawyer would charge. You see, Mr. Lincoln was still but the one-horse lawyer of a one-horse town. End of section 60. This recording is in the public domain. Section 61 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Kentuckians are clanny. Read for LibriVox.org. Senator John C. S. Blackburn, of the United States Supreme Court, began his life as a lawyer at the age of twenty. This should have won him sympathy in his first case. It was before Justice McLean. Opposed to Mr. Blackburn was the chief of the Chicago Bar, I. N. Arnold, afterward member of Congress, and author of the first biography of Abraham Lincoln. Blackburn was a Kentuckian, but, but the stereotyped reputation for courage does not include audacity in a court of law. He was nervous with this first attempt, and made a mull of his presentment, when a gentleman of the bar, rising and extending a tall, ungraceful figure, intervened and laid down the case on the young Kentuckian's lines so feebly offered and entangled, that the hearers might be glad to be so disembarrassed of a feeling for the novice floundering. The bench sustained Blackburn's demurrer. Arnold was so vexed that he objected to the volunteer intervener, whereupon the befriended man learned it was one Abraham Lincoln, as unknown to him as he was to fame. Lincoln defended himself against the senator's spite, by saying he claimed the privilege of giving a newcomer the helping hand. No doubt the fellow stateship backed his prompting. Related by Judge Isaac N. Arnold, Member of Congress. 
End of section 61. This recording is in the public domain. Section 62 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not to be thought of. Read for LibriVox.org by Tricia G. Not to be thought of. It has been seen that creditors treated the struggling Lincoln with the utmost forbearance, countering the adage that forbearance is not acquittance. He was given the occasion to show how he was neighborly when the turn came. A client of his was long deferring settlement when the lawyer met him by chance on the courthouse steps at Springfield. He accosted him cordially and remarked about an accident that had befallen him. Cogdale had been blown up by gunpowder and lost a hand. He began to apologize for the business delay, showing that he was crippled manually as well as in his pursuits. Lincoln plainly expressed his sympathy and sorrow. I have been thinking about that note of yours, faltered the unhappy man. The lawyer drew the paper in question out of his wallet and forced it upon him. It is not to be thought of, replied he, laughing in his droll yet saturnine mode. Cogdale honestly added that he did not know when he really could pay. But the donee hurried away, saying, If you had the money, I would not take it out of your only hand. End of section 62 this recording is in the public domain. Section 63 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Skin Right and Close Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Skin Right and Close In more than one event the Lincolnian snappy and headlong manner was the fruit of study and deliberation. Apparently holding aloof from politics after his return from Washington in 1849, Lincoln was earning a great name at the bar. His popularity was the wider as he did not disdain poor clients and often won a case without permitting any remuneration. There came to Lincoln and Herndon's office one day a poor widow. She was entitled to a pension of $400, but the agent, one Wright, who had drawn it for her, retained one half as his fee. This greed so stirred Mr. Lincoln that he at once went to the agent to demand disgorging of the money. On refusal, a suit was instituted for the recovery. At the trial, with his buoyancy, Lincoln said to his partner, You had better stay and hear me address the jury, as I am going to skin right and get the money back. He pleaded that there was no contract between the parties, that the man was not an authorised agent, his charge was unreasonable, he had never given the money due to the soldier's widow, but retained one half. Next, he expatiated on her husband. During the Revolutionary War, experiencing the hardships of the old Continentals at Valley Forge in the winter, barefoot in the deep snows, ill-clad against the rigours, their feet cut by ice staining the ground, and so on. The men in the box were also affected to tears, like the spectators, while the pension shark wriggled under the invectives. The verdict was in favour of the relict. Her advocate not only remitted his cost, but paid her fair home and for her stay in Springfield so that she went off rejoicing. Lincoln's partner had the curiosity to look at his brief, which concluded, Skin right. Close. Related by Mr. Herndon, present at the trial. End of section 63. This recording is in the public domain. Section 64 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hooking Hens is Low. Read for LibriVox.org. Mr. Lincoln had assisted in the prosecution of a fellow who stole some fowls. The lawyer jogged homeward in the company of the jury foreman. He eulogized the young man for his good work in the prosecution, and when the other returned the compliment by speaking warmly of the jury's prompt and speedy deliverance of the verdict, the foreman replied, Yes, the vagabond ought to be locked up. Why, when I was young and perder than I am now, I didn't mind packing a sheep or two off on my back. But stealing hens, bah! It is low and shows what the country is coming to. End of section 64. This recording is in the public domain. Section 65 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. THE STATE AGAINST MR. WHISKEY 
when lincoln was a briefless barrister frequenting the courts on their own peregrinations to catch the eye of client or judge he was at clinton illinois where a case came up of a very modern nature to be sure the shrieking sisterhood was then invented for the advocates of female suffrage and anti-slavery but these twelve or fifteen young women presented themselves in custody for a novel charge they had failed to induce a liquor dealer to restrict his license and smashed his wine parlor incontinently although public sympathy was theirs for the act as well as for their youth prettiness and sex none of the lawyers would take up their defense on account of the influence of the brewers and distillers agent in this emergency abraham lincoln stepped into the breach and volunteered to defend the defenseless i would suggest first began he that there be a change in the indictment so as to have it read the state against mr whiskey instead of the state against these women this is the defense of these women the man who has persisted in selling whiskey has had no regard for their well-being or the welfare of their husbands and sons he has had no fear of god or regard for man neither has he any regard for the laws of the statute no jury can fix any damages or punishment for any violation of the moral law the course pursued by this liquor dealer has been for the demoralization of society his groggery has been a nuisance these women finding all moral suasion of no avail with this fellow oblivious to all to all tender appeal and alike regardless of their tears and prayers in order to protect their households and promote the welfare of the community united to suppress the nuisance the good of society demanded its suppression they accomplished what otherwise could not have been done the lincoln magazine end of section 65 this recording is in the public domain section 66 of the lincoln storybook by henry l williams as clear as moonshine read for LibriVox.org. in 1858 lincoln was committed to the political campaign which was a passing victory superficially to his opponent senator douglas to eventuate in his accession to the presidency so he had let legal strife fall into abeyance during two years he was therefore vexed to have an applicant for his renewing that line of business but at once welcomed the suitor on learning her name it was hannah armstrong he was eager to see her she was the wife of the bully of clary's grove the locally noted wrestler jack armstrong after they had become friends, Lincoln had been harbored in their cottage in the days when poverty held him down, so he scarcely could let his head above water. The good soul had repaid his doing chores about her house, such as minding the baby, getting in the firewood, and keeping the highway cows out of her cabbage patch, after her husband died, by darning his socks, filling up a bowl with corn mush, at the period when it was a feast to have cheese, bologna, and crackers, in the garret where he pored over law books. Her news was painful. The baby, whose cradle Lincoln had rocked, was a man now, and was in what the vernacular phrased pretty considerable of a tight fix. It looked as though Mr. Lincoln would have difficulty in loosening the fix, far more to remove it. At a camp meeting the young men had been riotous. Armstrong and a companion had been entangled in a fight for all comers, in which one man was seriously injured by some weapon. The companion, Norris, was tried and convicted for manslaughter of Metzger, receiving the sentence of eight years' imprisonment. But Armstrong was to be indicted for murder, as the injuries were indicated as inflicted with a blunt instrument, and a witness confirmed that they were done by a slung shot in Armstrong's hands. It was little excuse that he, like the rest implicated, was drunk at the time. Nevertheless, dissolute as was the young man of two-and-twenty, Lincoln did not need the woman's assurance that her son was incapable of murder so deliberate. Armstrong averred that any blow he struck was done with the naked fist. Furthermore, it was said that Metzger was not left insensible on the field of battle, but was going home beside a yoke of oxen when the yoke end cracked his skull. It was this, and no slung shot, that caused his death the following day. Recognizing that the complication forebode a strenuous task, Lincoln nonetheless accepted it, and assuring his old Aunt Hannah that he would not suffer her to talk of remuneration, he resumed the toga to contest the effort to take away Armstrong's life, and release Norris, as convicted under error. He closeted himself with the prisoner to hear his account, and upon that concluded he was guiltless. It has been said that Lincoln would never undertake a defense of a man he believed guilty. 
This held good in the present instance. As the statement about the slung-shot blow was made by a man who disputed the ox-yoke accident, and that the fatal hurts were received in the free fight at the camp-meeting, it was necessary that he should be explicit. He had seen the blow and distinguished the weapon by the light of the moon. Lincoln was accustomed from early life to relieve his brain when toiling or distressed, by the turning to a vein utterly opposed to those moods. His chief diversion from Blackstone and the statutes was his favorite author, Shakespeare. Hackett, the Falstaff, delighted in by our grandfathers, pronounced the President a better student of that dramatist than he expected to meet. As the ancients drew fates, as it is called, from Virgil, and the medievalists from the Bible, so the lawyer drew hints from his author. The process is to open at a page and read, as a forecast, the first line meeting the eye. The playbook opened at Midsummer Night's Dream. To refresh himself after his speeches in rehearsal, Lincoln had been enjoying the humor of the amateur actor clowns. So the line, leaping into sight, was on parallel lines with his thought. "'Does the moon shine that night?' So the text. Whereupon Nick Bottom, a weaver, cries out, "'A calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out moonshine!' The pleader had his cue. It was not necessary to postpone the trial on the ground that the debate upon the new charge prevented a fair jury in the district. Besides, the widow would grow mad in the long suspense, even if the prisoner bore it manfully, though sorrowing for her and his misspent life. The trial was indeed the event of the year at the courthouse. The witnesses for the prosecution repeated about Armstrong much the same story as had convicted Norris. Armstrong had led a reprehensible career, and the deliberate onslaught with a weapon after the fight could hardly have been made by an intoxicated man. It was vindictiveness from being worsted by the unhappy Metzger in a fair fight. In vain was it cited that he and Metzger had been friends, and that the accuser was a personal enemy of the former. The case looked so formidable, unanswerable in short, that the state proctor's plea for condemnation might all but be taken for granted. However highly the prisoner had been elated by his father's friend, his own, having promised to deliver him before sundown, he must have lost the lift-up for he wore the abandoned expression of one forsaken by his own hopes as by his friends. Norris, in his cell, could not have been more veritably the picture of despair. Lincoln rose for the final, without eliciting any emotion from him. He dilated on the evidence, which he asserted boldly was proof of a plot against an innocent youth. He called the principal witness back to the stand, and caused him definitely to repeat that he had seen Armstrong strike the fatal stroke, with a slung-shot, undoubtedly, and by the light of the moon. The proof that his accusation was false was in the advocate's hand, the almanac, which the usher handed unto the jury, while the judge consulted one on his desk. The whole story was a fabrication to avenge a personal enmity, and the rock of the prosecution was blasted by the defense's fiery eloquence. The arbiters went out for half an hour, but the audience, waiting in breathless impatience, discounted the result. The twelve filed in to utter the alleviating, not guilty, and the liberator was able to fulfill his pledge. It was not sunset, and the prisoner was free to comfort his mother. In vain did she talk of paying a fee, and the man supported the desire by alleging his intention to work the debt out. Lincoln said in the old familiar tongue, "'Aunt Hannah, I shan't charge you a red. I said without money or price, and anything I can do for you and yours shall not cost you a cent.' Soon after, as she wrote to him of an attempt to deprive her of her land, he bade her force a case into the court, appeal to the Supreme Court, where his law firm would act, and he would fight it out. Regarding the rescued man, he enlisted in the war at the first call. He was still in the ranks two years later, when his mother, in her loneliness, begged for him of the President, Commander-in-Chief, for his release to come home. His leave was immediately written out by Lincoln's own hand, and the soldier went home from Kentucky. He remained a valuable citizen. It was Lincoln's speech and the moonbeam of inspiration that saved him. End of section 66. This recording is in the public domain. Section 67 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Nice clothes may make a handsome man, even of you. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. In 1832, Lincoln, elected to the Illinois Legislative Chamber, found himself in one of those anguishing embarrassments besetting him in all the early stages of his unflagging ascent from the social slough of despond. 
Unlike eels, he never got used to skinning. For the new station, however well provided mentally, he had no means to procure dress fit for the august halls of debate. He was yet standing behind the counter in Offutt's general shop at New Salem, when an utter stranger strolled in, asked his name, though his exceptional stature and unrivaled mien revealed his identity, and announced his own name. Each had heard of the other. The newcomer was not an Adonis, perhaps, but he was one compared with the awkward, leaning tower of Pisa, Cornstalk, who carried the jackknife as the homeliest man in the section. Lincoln was doubly the plainest speaker there and thereabouts. "'Mr. Smoot,' began the clerk, "'I am disappointed in you, sir. I expected to see a scaly specimen of humanity.' "'Mr. Lincoln, I am sorely disappointed in you, in whom I expected to see a good-looking man.' After this jocular exchange of greeting, the joke cemented friendship between them. The proof of the friendship is in the usefulness of it. Lincoln turned to this acquaintance in his dilemma. The future president may have divined the saying of the similarly martyred McKinley about the cheap clothes making a cheap man. He summed up his situation. I must certainly have decent clothes to go there among the celebrities. No doubt the state capital had other fashions than those prevailing at Sangamon Town, where even the shopkeeper's present attire, in which he had solicited suffrages, was scoffed at as below the mark. It was composed of flax and tow linen pantaloons, one Ellis storekeeper describes from eyewitnessing. I thought about five inches too short on the legs, exposing blue yarn socks the original of the farmer's socks of our mail-order magazines. No vest or coat, and but one suspender. He wore a calico shirt, as he had in the Black Hawk War, coarse brogans, tan color. "'As you voted for me,' went on the ambitious man, about to exchange the counter for the rostrum, "'you must want me to make a decent appearance in the State House?' "'Certainly,' was the reply, as anticipated." Lincoln was so sure of his wheedling ways by this time. And the friend in need supplied him with two hundred dollars currency, which, according to the budding legislator's promise, he returned out of his first pay as representative. End of section sixty seven. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The abutment was dubersome. Read for LibriVox.org. President Lincoln was told that the Northern and Southern Democrats had at last accomplished a fusion. Well, I believe you, of course, said he to the informant, but I have my doubts of the foundation, like my friend Brown. Brown is a sound church member. He was a member, too, of a township committee, having to receive bids for building a bridge over a deep and rapid river. The contractors did not seem to like the proposition, so Brown called in an architectural acquaintance, named, we will say, Jones. At the question, Can you build this bridge? he was overbold, and replied, Yes, sir, or any other. I could build a bridge from Sodom to Gomorrah with abutment below. The committee, being good and select men, were shocked at the strong language, and Brown was called upon to defend his protege. I know Jones well enough, he rejoined, and he is so honest a man and so good a builder, that if he states positively that he can build a bridge from Sodom to Gomorrah, why, I believe him. But I feel bound to state that I am in some doubt as to the abutment on the other side. My friend, I reassert I have my doubts about the abutment. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Good Enough for the President Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Good Enough for the President It was while at the store in New Salem that Lincoln made the acquaintance of Richard Yates, contemporarily in office with him as War Governor of Illinois. So proud were the citizens of the colloquial abilities of their rising young man that they used to show him to visitors as their lion. Yates was introduced and stayed to hear him roar. Later, Lincoln asked him to join him in his noon meal at the cabin where a woman boarded him. 
The latter was one of those good souls who give the best in the larder, but are all the time apologising. They had happened upon the ordinarily plain repast of bread, homemade, and the sweetest of corn, and milk from the cow. Flurried by the unknown company, the auntie, in dealing out the bowls to a numerous family, somehow, between herself and Lincoln, let the vessel slip, and falling to the floor it was smashed and the milk wasted. Lincoln disputed it was her fault, as she politely averred. She continued to argue for her guiltiness. Oh, very well, said Lincoln at last. We will not wrangle on who was asleep, or if it does not trouble you, it will not trouble me. Anyway, what is a basin of pap? Nothing to fret about. Mr. Lincoln, you are wrong. The woman remembered the children to whom a lesson ought to be given. A dish of bread and milk is fit for the President of the United States. Both the guests are quest. The cream of a story is in the application. Years afterward, when the man from Sangamon, the unknown, occupied the Carroll chair, an elderly woman from Illinois called at the White House and requested an interview. It was the Aunt Lizzie of the above episode. Her mere mention of being home folks won her admittance and her recognition the best of the executive mansion lard pantry. When she had finished the elegant collation and intermingled the tasty morsels with reminiscences, the host slyly inquired if now in the presidential dwelling she stuck to the sentiments about the dye enunciated in her log cabin. Indeedy I do. I still stick to it that bread and milk is a good enough dish for the President. Lincoln smiled with his sad smile. He had been long not to say a lengthy martyr to dyspepsia, and she uttered a truism that struck him to the digestive apparatus. End of section 69. This recording is in the public domain. Section 70 of the Lincoln's Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's First Political Speech. Read for LibriVox.org. In 1831 or 32, Abraham Lincoln made his maiden political speech at Pappsville, or Richland, Illinois. He was twenty-three and timid, and the preceding speakers had rolled the sun nearly down. The speech is, therefore, short and agreeable. Gentlemen, fellow citizens, I presume you all know who I am, I am humble Abraham Lincoln. I have been solicited by my friends to become a candidate for the legislature. My politics are short and sweet, like an old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank, the international improvement scheme, and a high protective tariff. These are my sentiments and political principles. If elected, I will be thankful. If defeated, it will be all the same. Springfield Republican. End of section 70. This recording is in the public domain. Section 71 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Lightning Rod to Protect a Guilty Conscience Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman One term in the Illinois State Legislature only wedded the predestined politician for a seat again at that table, though it was not he who won the loaves and the fishes. He was to speak at Springfield, the more gloriously welcomed as he was prominent in the movement hereafter realized of changing the capital from vandalia to this more energetic town the meeting had foreboded ill as a serious wrangle between two of the preceding speakers threatened to end in a challenge to a duel still a fashionable diversion but lincoln intervened with a speech so enthralling that the hearers forgot the dispute and heard him out with rapture. He had found the proper way to manage his voice, never musical, by controlling the nasal twang into a monotonous but audible sharpness, carrying to a great distance. He was followed by one George Falker, a facing both ways, profit-taking politician, who had achieved his end by obtaining an office. This was the land office register at this town. He had been a prominent Whig representative in 1834. The turncoat assailed Lincoln bitterly, much as Pitt was derided in his beginning, and had begun his piece by announcing that the young man, Lincoln, must be taken down. As if to live up to the lucrative berth, Mr. Farker had finished a frame house. Springfield still had log houses, and not only in the environs either. 
and to cap the novelty, had that other new feature, a lightning rod, put upon it. The object of the slur at youth had listened to the diatribe, flattering only so far as he was singled out. Mr. Joshua F. Speed, a bosom friend of Lincoln, reports the retort as follows. The gentleman says that this young man must be taken down. It is for you, not for me, to say whether I am up or down. The gentleman has alluded to my being a young man. I am older in years than in the tricks and trades of politicians. I desire to live, and I desire place and distinction as a politician. But I would rather die now than, like the gentleman, live to see the day that I would have to erect a lightning rod to protect a guilty conscience from an offended God. Mr. Speed says that the reply was characterized by great force and dignity. The happy image of the lightning rod for a conscience has passed into the fixed star stage of a household word throughout the West. End of section 71. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 72 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Firing on a Flea for a Squirrel. Read for LibriVox.org by Jeremiah Britt. Firing on a Flea for a Squirrel. In 1841, while serving a term in the Illinois legislature, Lincoln was the longest of the Sangamon representatives, distinguished as the Long Nine. They were much hampered by an old member who tried to put a stopper upon any measure on the set ground that it was unconstitutional. Lincoln was selected to spike his gun. A measure was introduced benefiting the Sangamon district so that its electee might befittingly push it and defend it. He was warrantably its usher when the habitual interrupter bawled his stereotyped unconstitutional. The quasher is reported as follows in the local press, if not in the journal of the house, which one need not, perhaps, consult. Mr. Speaker, said the son of the Sagamon Vale, the attack of the member from Wabash County upon the unconstitutionality of this measure reminds me of an old friend of mine. He was a peculiar-looking old fellow, with shaggy, overhanging eyebrows, and a pair of spectacles under them. This description fitted the Wabash member, at whom all gaze was directed. One morning, just after the old soul got up, he imagined he saw a gray squirrel on a tree near his house. So he took down his rifle, and fired at the squirrel, as he believed, but the squirrel paid no attention to the shot. He loaded and fired again, and again, until, at the thirteenth shot, he set down his gun impatiently, and said to his boy, looking on, Boy, there's something wrong about this rifle. Rifle's all right, I know it is, answered the boy. But where's your squirrel? "'Don't you see him, humped up about halfway up the tree?' inquired the old man, peering over his spectacles and getting mystified. "'No, I don't,' responded the boy. And then turning and looking into his father's face, he exclaimed, "'Yes, I spy your squirrel. You have been firing at a flea on your own brow.' This modern version of seeing the moat and not the beam in one's own eye smothered the member for Wabash in laughter, and he dropped the standard objection of unconstitutional, as he had not his mark. End of section 72 This recording is in the public domain. Section 73 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Cream of the Joke Read for LibriVox.org by reason of the distances and the lonesomeness, it was the pleasant habit of candidates to make their electioneering tours together. 
In seeking re-election in 1838, Lincoln was accompanied by Mr. Ewing. They stopped at one country house about dark, when the good wife was going a-milking, while her husband was still afield. Intent on securing her, as she had the repute of being the grey mare, the two partisans accompanied her to the paddock. Ewing, to show his gallantry as well as his familiarity with farm work, a main point in such communities, offered to relieve the dame of the pail and fillet while she rested. In the meantime Lincoln chatted with her, so that Ewing could hardly get a word in. At his finishing his self-chosen task, he beheld the pair deeply absorbed, for Lincoln had exercised his glib tongue to such advantage as to secure her influence over her man's vote. End of section 73. This recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. Parallel Courses In the 13th Congress, Jefferson Davis was in the Senate, while Lincoln and Alexander Stevens were in the House. End of section 74. This recording is in the public domain. Section 75 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Jumping Jim Crow. When in Congress he was a conscious Whig, as opposed to the cotton ones, that is, for the anti-slavery doctrine and not for cottoning for the South. He wrote home, as you at Springfield are all so anxious for me to distinguish myself, I have concluded to do so before long. He nearly extinguished himself, for suddenly he went right about face, according to the popular song, quite a political, if not a politic, course. You wheel about and jump about, and do just so, and every time you jump about you jump Jim Crow. He had gone against the general tide in hindering the Mexican War, as sure to bring Texas into the Union as a slave state, yet now he espoused its hero, Rough and Ready Taylor. He had to excuse himself as recognizing that the general was the Whig's best candidate, and as the Whig National Convention agreed with him, the apparent truckling was condoned. End of section 75. This recording is in the public domain. Section 76 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Facts are Stubborn Things. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Facts are Stubborn Things. Your letter on McClellan reminds me of a story that I, Abraham Lincoln, heard in Washington when I was here before. There was an editor in Rhode Island noted for his love of fun. It came to him irresistibly, and he could not help saying just what came to his mind. He was appointed postmaster by Tyler. Some time after Tyler vetoed the bank bill and came into disrepute with the Whigs, a conundrum went the round of the papers. It was as follows. Why is John Tyler like an ass? The editor copied the conundrum and could not resist the temptation to answer it, and which he did thus, because he is an ass. This piece of fun cost him his head, but it was a fact. Shatark Democrat End of section 76 this recording is in the public domain. Section 77 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Party Gad. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. Footnote. Wilmot Proviso. That money to buy Mexican land should not go toward slave buying. In 1846, General Cass was for the Wilmot Proviso at once. In March 1846, he was still for it, but not just then. And in December 1847, he was against it altogether. When the question was raised in 1846, he was in a blustering hurry to take ground for it. He sought to be in advance and to avoid the uninteresting position of a mere follower. But soon he began to see a glimpse of the great democratic oxgad waving in his face, and to hear instinctively a voice saying, Back, back, sir, back a little. He shakes his head and bats his eyes and blunders back to his position of March 1847. And still the gad waves and the voice grows more distinct and sharper still. Back, sir, back, I say, farther back. 
and back he goes to the position of December 1847, at which the gad is still, and the voice soothingly says, So, stand still at that. Speech by A. Lincoln, House of Representatives, Washington, July 27, 1848. End of section 77. This recording is in the public domain. Section 78 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hard to Beat. Read for LibriVox.org. Of his Washington experience in 1848, Lincoln brought a pack of tales about the statesmen then prominent. He declared to have heard of Daniel Webster the subjoined. In school little Dan had been guilty of some misdoing for which he was called up to the teacher to be caned on the hand. His hands were dirty, and to save appearance he moistened his right hand on his way up, and wiped it on his pants. Nevertheless it looked so foul on presentation to the feral, that the teacher sharply protested, "'Well, this is hard to beat. If you will find another hand in this room as filthy, I will let you off.' Daniel popped out his left hand, modestly kept in the background, and readily cried, "'Here it is, sir!' told by Lincoln before the Honorable Mr. Odell and others. This is not the ex-governor, Mr. Odell, of New York, who pleads guilty to the editor of being too young to have had the honor of speaking with Mr. Lincoln. The worst luck, both would have profited by the mutual pleasure. End of section 78. This recording is in the public domain. Section 79 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams I reckon I took more than my share. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell Lincoln confessed at the outset of life that he was going to avoid society, as its frequentation was incompatible with study. He avowed at the same time that he liked it, which enhanced the sacrifice. No doubt so, since his Washington sojourn and his legal and legislative company earned him the title of the Prince of Goodfellows. To be coupled with the genial Martin Van Buren with the same epithet was indeed a compliment. At Washington he had, in 1848, made acquaintance with the fashionable world. He preferred the livelier and less straight ways of the Congressional boarding house table, the Saturday parties at Daniel Webster's, and the motley crowd at the bowling alley, as well as the chatterer's corner in the congressional post office. Still, as chairman of a committee, and by reason of his being a wonder from the Harrisute West, he was invited to the receptions and feast of the first families. Green to the niceties of the table, he committed errors, so frankly apologized for and humorously treated, that he lost no standing. At one dinner the experience was new to him of the dish of currant jelly being passed around for each guest to transfer a little to his plate, so he took it as a sweet, oddly accompanying the venison, and left but little on the general plate. But after tasting it he perceived that the compote dish was going the rounds, and suddenly, looking pointedly at his plate, and then at the hostess, with a troubled air he said, with convincing simplicity, "'It looks like I took more than my share.' Supplied by the hostess and collected by J. R. Speed. End of section seventy nine. This recording is in the public domain. Section eighty of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln was loaded for bear. Read for LibriVox.org. An eminent man of politics has said that the similes of the learned, which liken Abraham Lincoln to King Henry the Fourth of France, and other historical notables, are far from the mark, and reveal their misapprehension of the Machiavel redeemed by moral goodness. He thinks that without the hypocrisy being censurable, he was more of the type of Pope Sixtus V. This celebrity, who, like Lincoln, was in the hog business at one time, pretended silliness to be elected pontiff. The die cast, he stood forth in all his native strength, keeping the friends who did not try to sway him, and becoming a rod of steel where he had been rated as lead. Footnote. Greeley stamped Lincoln as the slowest piece of lead that ever crawled. At the same time as he disparaged himself, mocked and laughed, he let out glimpses of true ambition, when his short-sighted advisers warmly crossed his ground of setting himself with freedom against the pro-slavery party, 
assuring him that he would thereby lose the senatorship as against Douglas, he confessed, I am after larger game. The battle of 1860 for the chair of Washington is worth a hundred of this. End of section 80. This recording is in the public domain. Section 81 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A bounteous president, if anything is left. Read for LibriVox.org by Kidder. Mr. Speaker, we have all heard of the animal standing in doubt between two stacks of hay and starving to death. The like of that would never happen to General Cass. Place the stacks a thousand miles apart. He would stand stock still, midway between them, and eat both at once and the green grass along the line would be apt to suffer some too at the same time. By all means, make him president, gentlemen. He will feed you bounteously, if, if, there is anything left after he shall have helped himself. Speech, House of Representatives, July 27, 1848. End of section 81. This recording is in the public domain. Section 82 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Art of Being Paid to Eat Read for LibriVox.org I have introduced General Cass's accounts here chiefly to show the wonderful physical capacities of the man. They show that he not only did the labor of several men at the same time, but that he often did it at several places many hundred miles apart at the same time. And at eating, too, his capacities are shown to be quite as wonderful— from October 1821 to May 1822, he ate ten rations a day in Michigan, ten a day here in Washington, and near five dollars worth a day besides, partly on the road between the two places. And then there is an important discovery in his example, the art of being paid for what one eats, instead of having to pay for it. Hereafter, if any nice man shall owe a bill which he cannot pay, he can just board it out. Speech, House of Representatives, July 27, 1848 a tilt at a general drawing rations for himself and staff. End of section 82. This recording is in the public domain. Section 83 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Advice Not to Say No Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots Mr. Lincoln said to General Viel, If I have got one vice, it is not being able to say no, and I consider it a vice. Thank God for not making me a woman. I presume if he had, he would have made me just as homely as I am, and nobody would have ever tempted me. End of recording. End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Best Car Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence The Best Car From his previous sojourn in the capital, President Lincoln had a fund of good stories upon his predecessors. Among them was the following tale about President Tyler, one of the weakest chiefs the Republic has ever known with the exception of Franklin Pierce. Lincoln said that this president's son, Bob, was sent by his father to arrange about a special train for an excursion. The railroad agent happened to be a hard-shell Whig, and having no fear of the great, and wanting no favor, shrank from allowing him any. He said that the road did not run any specials for presidents. Stop! interrupted Bob. Did you not furnish a special for General President Harrison? Died 1841. Suppose we did, answered the superintendent. Well, if you will bring your father here in that condition, you shall have the best train on the track. End of section 84. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, November 2008. Section 85 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. 
Self-made. Read for LibriVox.org. Self-made or never made, says one of the apologists for Lincoln's ruggedness of character and outward air, at an early political meeting, when asked if he were self-made, and he answered in the affirmative, the rough critic remarked, then it is a poor job, as if it were by nature's apprentice. But in 1860, when friends reproached him for the lack of old hickory, Jackson's sternness, he replied nobly, I am just as God made me, and cannot change. End of section 85. This recording is in the public domain. Section 86 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. His High Mightiness. Read for LibriVox by David Lawrence. His High Mightiness. The little court of the White House, wrangling about a fit title for the chief, that of excellency not being taken as sufficient, one disputant suggested that the Dutch one of high mightiness might fit. Speaker Mullenberg, at the first presidency, pronounced on the question at a dinner where Washington was sitting. Why, General, if we were certain the office would always be held by men as large as yourself, how cleverly he shunned the use of either great or grand, or Mr. Wyckoff there, it would be appropriate enough. But if by chance a president as small as my opposite neighbor should be elected, his high mightiness would be ridiculous. The quarrelers were hushed, thinking if Douglas, the little giant, had proceeded or should follow their colossus of six feet three. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario. December 2008. Section 87 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Opinion at Thirty. Diffident, but having been twice disappointed in love-making, Abraham wrote in support of a Miss Owen rejecting him, I should never be satisfied with any one blockheaded enough to have me. End of section 87. This recording is in the public domain. Section 88 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Blank Biography Read for LibriVox.org Lincoln had been reading from Edmund Burke's life when he threw down the book with disrelish. He fell into his habit of musing, and on reviving, said to his associate Herndon, I've wondered why book publishers do not have blank biographies on their shelves, always ready for an emergency, so that if a man happens to die, his heirs or his friends, if they wish to perpetuate his memory, can purchase one already written, but with blanks. These blanks they can fill up with rosy sentences full of high-sounding praise. He sent the Dictionary of Congress his autobiography in a single paragraph of fifty words, as an example. End of section 88. This recording is in the public domain. Section 89 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Homeliest Man Under Government Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The Homeliest Man Under Government When General Lee surrendered to General Grant, one point was noticed by the spectators, which, it was held, distinguished the Cavalier from the Puritan. Grant was in his fighting clothes and his everyday sword by his side, while General Lee, dressed faultlessly as a soldier should always be, carried a court sword, presented him as an honour by the Southerners. So, in wars, Providence does not flourish the showy weapon, but uses a strong and sharp blade without ornamental hilt. Abraham Lincoln was the instrument of heaven for work. Ceaseless, bloody work, hard, for it was the least to his taste. From boyhood, the looks of the woodchipper and river boatman were subjects of jeering. Whether the budding genius spurned such adventurous aids as graces of person in his career, or was already a philosopher who believed that handsome is that handsome does, is a winning motto, we may never know. It is enough that he joined in the laugh and kept the ball rolling. 
on the loss of a first love, one Annie Rutledge, a name he said he always loved. His friends were alarmed for his health and sanity. They took away the knife every man carried in the West, and discovered it was the obligatory one presented to the ugliest man, and not to be disposed of otherwise than to one still homelier. There is a record of the clerical gentleman to whom Lincoln was justified in offering it, who died with it in his uncontested possession in Toronto. As is the custom of an office holder going out of his seat, calls on the president with his successor to transfer the seals and other tokens. The unlucky man enumerated the good qualities of his substitute and was surprised that Mr. Lincoln should dilate upon his with excessive regrets that he was going to leave the service. This Mr. Addison was indeed a first-class servant, but uncommonly ill-favoured. Yes, Addison, said the chief, I have no doubt that Mr. Price is a pearl of price, but... But nothing can compensate me for the loss of you, for when you retire, I shall be the homeliest man in the government. End of section 89. This recording is in the public domain. Section 90 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Better looking than expected. Related by the President to Grace Greenwood. As I recall it, the story, told very simply and tersely, but with inimitable drollery, ran that a certain honest old farmer, visiting the capital for the first time, was taken by the member of Congress for his district to some large gathering or entertainment. He went in order to see the President. Unfortunately, Mr. Lincoln did not appear, and the Congressman, being a bit of a wag and not liking to have his constituent disappointed, designated Mr. R. of Minnesota. He was a gentleman of a particularly round and rubicund countenance. The worthy agriculturalist, greatly astonished, exclaimed, Is that old Abe? Well, I do declare. He's a better looking man than I expected to see. But it do seem as how his troubles have drove him to drink. End of section 90. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, November 2008. Section 91 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln and Superstition. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell. Lincoln and Superstition. Childhood impressions are ineffaceable, though they may be for a time set aside. Abraham Lincoln, with all his lofty mind, acquiesced in the vulgar belief that he took his son Robert to have the benefit of a madstone at a distance from where the boy was dog-bitten. He made the pact with a divine power as to the Emancipation Act, with a sincerity which robbed worldly wisdom of its sting, and he had dreams and visions like a seer. End of section 91. This recording is in the public domain. Section 92 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Dream. Read for LibriVox.org. Before any great national event, I have always had the same dream. I had it the other night. It is a ship sailing rapidly. To a friend in April 1865. See Ship of State, a pet simile. End of section 92. This recording is in the public domain. Section 93 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Vision. Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman. Abraham Lincoln had been nominated for the presidency. The consummation of his ambition had naturally a deep impression upon him. He came home and threw himself on the lounge, expressly made to let him recline at full length. It was opposite a bureau on which was a pivoted mirror happening to be so tilted that it reflected him as he lay. As I reclined, he says, 
my eye fell upon the glass, and I saw two images of myself, exactly alike, except that one was a little paler than the other. I arose and lay down again with the same result. It made me quite uncomfortable for a few minutes, but some friends coming in, the matter passed out of my mind. The next day, while walking in the street, I was suddenly reminded of the circumstances, and the disagreeable sensation produced by it returned. I determined to go home and place myself in the same position as regards the mirror, and if the same effect was produced, I would make up my mind that it was the natural result of some principle of refraction or optics which I did not understand, and dismiss it. I tried the experiment with the same result, and, as I had said to myself, accounted for it on some principle unknown to me, and then it ceased to trouble me. But the God who works through the laws of nature must surely give a sign to me if one of his chosen servants, even through the operation of a principle of optics. This, seeing one's simulacrum, or double, was so common, especially when looking-glasses were full of flaws, designedly cast faulty to give magical effects for conjurers, that old books on the black art teem with instances. Lincoln was right to demonstrate that the vision was founded on fact, and no supernatural sight at all. His trying the repetition was like Lord Byron's quashing a similar illusion, but a suit of clothes hung up to look like a friend whom he believed he saw in the spirit. A more widely read man would have dismissed the fetch like the president-elect, but with a laugh. End of section 93. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 94 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. It is a poor sermon that does not fit somewhere. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. It is a poor sermon that does not hit somewhere. President Lincoln was wont to carry his mother's old Bible about with him in the capital city. Often he would be consulting it in mental plates. He said that the Psalms was the part he liked best. The Psalms have something for every day in the week, and something for every poor fellow like me. End of section 94. This recording is in the public domain. Section 95 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Religion of Feeling. Read for LibriVox.org. Lincoln told a friend that he heard a man named Glenn say at an Indiana church meeting, When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That is my religion. End of section 95. This recording is in the public domain. Section 96 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Two Prayers Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The Two Prayers in Lincoln's inaugural address will be found the passage about the sad singularity of the two contendants in the fratricidal combat being Christians alike. Both read the same Bible and prayed to the same God. The example is forthcoming. There is plenty of evidence that the speaker always took counsel of God. His words are, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. Footnote. No longer was Lincoln's piety held as hypocrisy, as in 1860 when a campaign song sneers at how each night he seeks the closet, there alone to kneel and pray. End of footnote. Connect with the Confederate commander, Robert E. Lee's avowal, I have never seen the day when I did not pray for the people of the North. Everybody thinks better than anybody. Lincoln. This is also ascribed to Talleyrand. It is only the rich who are robbed. End of section 96. This recording is in the public domain. Section 97 of the Lincoln Storybook 
by Henry L. Williams. We shall see our friends in heaven. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell. For weeks after the death of his son Willie, the inconsolable father mourned, in particular, on that day in each week. And even the military sights at Fortress Monroe to court a change failed to distract him. He was studying Shakespeare. Calling his private secretary to him, he read several passages, and finally that of Queen Constance's lament over her lost child. And, Father Cardinal, I have heard you say that we shall see, and know, our friends in heaven. King John, Act Three, Scene Four. If that be true, I shall see my boy again, he said. Colonel, did you ever dream of a lost friend, and feel that you were holding sweet communion with that friend, and yet have a sad consciousness that it was not reality? Just so I dream of my boy Willie. Colonel Lamon, the presidential bodyguard-in-chief, was the recipient of this spiritual confidence. End of section 97. This recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams More Praying and Less Swearing Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots On accompanying Mrs. Pomeroy, military nurse, to her hospital, the President discovered that the authorities of the house had forbidden praying to the patients, or even reading the Bible to them, as it was denominational. He promptly removed the restriction and furthered the visiting missionaries in holding prayer meetings, read the scriptures to his boys in blue, and pray with them as much as they pleased. If there was more praying, he said, and less swearing, it would be far better for our country. End of recording. End of section 98. This recording is in the public domain. Section 99 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Gloves or No Gloves Read for LibriVox.org An old acquaintance of the President's visited him at Washington. Each man's wife insisted on the gentleman, her lord, donning gloves. For they were going as a square party out in the presidential carriage, and the Washingtonians would not accept a king as such unless he dressed as a king. Mr. Lincoln, as a shrewd politician and a married man, put his gloves in his pocket, not to don them until there was no wriggling out of the fix. The other one had his on at the hotel where the carriage came to take that couple up. They went out and took seats in the vehicle, whereupon the newcomer, seeing that his host was ungloved, went on the rule of leaving the fence bars as you find them. He set to drawing off his kids at the same time as Mr. Lincoln commenced to tug at his to get them on. "'No, no, no,' protested the caller, fetching away his kids one at a time, it is none of my doings. Put up your mittens, Lincoln. And so they had their ride out without their hands being in guards. End of section 99. This recording is in the public domain. Section 100 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Use of Books. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. The Use of Books. Books serve to show a man that those original thoughts of his aren't very new after all. By an Illinois clergyman, knowing Lincoln in the fifties. End of section 100. This recording is in the public domain.